like a big deal now. <laughs> uh, I I imagine I'll be fired at any moment. Like, I just I was having a conversation with uh, one of my coworkers today, and we're just like, this is too easy. Like, it's 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 not easy in that there's every day a new like thing I'm trying to figure out how to fix because this stuff breaks all the time, but. Like, that's my job. So sometimes when things aren't breaking, I'm just sitting there. And so it's just like, oh, I probably shouldn't say this on tape, on a live stream. Hi, everybody. <laughs> uh, okay. Hearing Here we... about how Chris is worried about getting fired. Yeah. <laughs> I, I mean, I, I, like, when you work in creative work, sometimes you just feel like you're stealing money. Like, it, it is. It's, 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 uh, it's why the imposter syndrome is a real thing. Yeah, it really is. I, I would like to get to that point where I just feel like I'm stealing money. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. No, like you have to actually work for a living. <laughs> Most days, but Most what you days. do is needed, though. So, yeah, people need what you do. They don't need well, what I do. They, they need, need what no, you no, no. do. <laughs> Otherwise, there wouldn't be a job for it. All right, that's true. <laughs> God bless the free market. All right, here we go. Thank you, Jeremy. You are a blessed uh, subscriber. I have not seen your cousin try and hit the live stream so fyi but uh hi christopher thomas okay all right here we go kids time to get started jeremiah is trying to butt in already <laughs> who's keeping my lights on if dakota is there <laughs> all right here we go ready Welcome to We Are Libertarians. I'm your host, Chris Spangle. We bring you all of the irreverence modern politics deserves while putting people before political parties. We examine current events from a libertarian perspective with the goal of leaving you better informed. We're trying to make you sound smarter with your friends. Uh, please be sure to rate and review us on iTunes, like us on Facebook, and become a subscriber on Patreon at wearelibertarians.com. Without your financial support, independent media like this cannot exist. In exchange for supporting our program, we give you great bonus content. This show is crowdsourced, so if you uh, want to send us news, use the hashtag WALnews or in our Facebook group or Discord channel, which you can find at WeAreLibertarians.com. We are always taking your questions and comments via email at editor at WeAreLibertarians.com. Please be sure, please be warned. I'm struggling tonight, everybody. That uh, This show is raw, unedited, and authentic, so the language is sometimes strong and offensive. In this show, we're going to talk about the Libertarian Party. We have a little tough love for the Libertarian Party, its chairman, its vice chairman, the party as a whole, and what we expect as members. So that's what we're going to talk about. But first, let me introduce – this is probably the most handsome uh, episode of We Are Libertarians in history. <laughs> Ladies, if you are uh, uh, listening, you're going to go want to go watch the YouTube version of this because we have three good-looking gentlemen on the show tonight, starting with me, and then Shane Zollner. Shane, you have like a pocket square and a flower and a suit on. You look great. I had to do it up coming to the palace. Uh, that's right. Well, you honor me, <laughs> sir. So you look very good. You're also sitting on Harry's new chair. How does your butt feel? It's nice and soft, and yeah, it's great. Harry's delicate ass couldn't sit on one of my hard chairs, so he brought this dirty, dirty restaurant chair in here. Uh, we need to get a throne. I need, I need to get a better chair because sometimes you can hear my chair like it won't do it now. You can hear it squeaking in the background because it's this is like literally this is the table I grew up eating on, and these this table's thirty years old. And underneath is, you know, it's a wood table and, like, are the spiral notebook scratches from when I was doing my homework. So th <laughs> the chairs are all old, but, uh, yeah, we need to we, – uh, in time, we will get a professional studio with good chairs. But uh, for now, you sit on Harry's throne. Uh, Shane just got married. I did. You did. I was invited to the wedding, and thank you very much. No problem. Thanks for coming. Unlike our second guest, who did not invite me to his wedding, Dakota Davis, the co-host of the Boss Hog Liberty podcast, what do you have to say for yourself? Listen, man, it's just a small wedding. Okay. Yeah, it's close friends and family. Three, four hundred. Mm. And you know, yeah, yeah. We only ha we're only having like three hundred and fifty people come. <laughs> I'm not going to bust your balls because I was on the Boss Hog of Liberty last night, which is one of our sister podcasts that you can find at WeAreLibertarians.com. And uh, I busted your balls pretty good about it. Uh, I was not invited to the bachelor party, nor was I invited to the bridal shower. Nope. 
And I think that you were more upset about the bridal shower, if I'm not mistaken. Well, the ladies love Chris Spangle. What can yeah, I say? you were. I, that was in one of our chats. Was uh, Audrey had said something about the uh, the bridal shower, and you said, "Great, another thing I wasn't invited <laughs> to." <laughs> so it all stems from. About a year and a half ago, uh, it was at a Colts game, and Jer was tail- Jeremiah Morrill, the host of Boss Hog of Liberty, was tailgating outside of a Colts game, and he invited Aaron and Greg and a bunch of, and a couple other people, and so I just sit in there on a Sunday afternoon, and I see all my friends <laughs> having a party that I didn't know about, and I was I was like ah ah, ah, ah. <laughs> I, and so I just commented thanks for the invite. Next thing I know is I get tagged in a photo with all of them taking a selfie, and Jeremiah just writes, hanging out at the Colts games with all my friends. And I was like, you dick, all your friends. <laughs> all of his friends. So that's that's been the running joke is thanks for the invite. Uh, but See, I'm, you tried pulling that on me, though, with the bachelor party. You said, well, at least all of your friends are there. Right. Which was not true because my best man wasn't even there. Right. So... Don't don't feel that bad about it. You that should, you couldn't make it to my. You bachelor should party. hear the <laughs> list of people that was invited to the bachelor party before I was. I've given you, and you're like, what have you given me? I'm like a podcast. I gave you a reason <laughs> to exist. So uh, the <laughs> now Shane, you just got back from your honeymoon, right? I did. All right. How was that? Uh, great, except for the last day. I what happened? I drank way too much. Oh, <laughs> where did yep. you guys go? St. Pete, Florida. Oh, yeah. It's beautiful. Very nice. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. Now, uh, Dakota, where are you going on your honeymoon? Uh, okay. We're going to Maui, Hawaii. Uh, big spender. Right. Yeah. Nice. Now, uh, obviously, you know, you just made love for the first time, Shane. Uh, I did, yes. So can you please give Dakota sex tips? Yeah. Am I going to have to take notes for this? Uh, probably, How expensive yeah. is it going to get? Uh, you got like a 500-page binder. <laughs> 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 All right. Well, we are excited for uh, for the two married men here. So, we ladies, they're they're handsome. You can just look at them, but don't touch. <laughs> don't be Kevin Spacey. It just depends on how much money they're offering. Sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> <I'm>, <laughs> you better We're going to auction off Dakota. <laughs> you better hope Audrey is not watching. <laughs> and you know, you know right now. <laughs> Jeremiah is starting drama. You'll never guess what he's in one of your group chats. Yeah. What what is going on? He said, Audrey, turn on Facebook right now. Right. <laughs> oh boy. Well, I couldn't be happier for you. I'm very excited for you to get married. Uh even though I'm not invited, it's fine. It's fine. <laughs> Whatever. Uh but it was it was a fun episode. I had a lot of fun on the Boss Hog of Liberty. Uh even though Jeremiah was there. Uh, it is fun to just like I forget. I forget. Like I called it the Boss Hog of Liberty because Jeremiah's bossy, and I and like he's not like he's not awful. Like Jeremiah I, is one of my best friends in the world. And yeah, we we make fun of him more than what he really is. Right, like, couldn't be a better human being alive. And but he is bossy, and it showed in that episode. So you need to go to wearelibertarians dot com and listen to the episode because. I I make sure to point out every single time he's being the boss hog of liberty, and da- and Dakota couldn't have loved it more. It was I was cracking up so hard. I was, <laughs> There's not room for two ruthless dictators. No, there? no, <laughs> that is a lesser kingdom. They are they are aware of it, and they they show homage. Do you not? Uh, we do. Yep. We still call him dear leader. It, yep. You know, as long as he returns the favor and calls Jeremiah boss hog. Yes. Okay. Uh, that's how it goes. <laughs> uh, good time. So be sure to check that out. We we may or may not see James Neese tonight. So we yeah. have, we have at least heard from him. He told me thirty <laughs> minutes ago he'd be here in twenty minutes. Right. Well, one time he said he would be on time, and then he showed up two and a half hours into the podcast. So like if you go to the Fireside site wal dot fireside dot fm and you look at the hosts and you see James Neese go to his first appearance. He just shows up two and a half hours into the podcast <laughs> and then tells, like, the craziest stories about, like, eating trash and, like, sleeping on beaches in Jacksonville and Skid Row in L.A. It's, it was crazy. So yeah, James Neese got kicked out of uh, the Facebook group and Capistan this week. Really? Yeah, he got he got a perma band. The band hammer came down, which I didn't even know you could be banned from that group. It, like, like, explain <laughs> the group. Uh, it is just shit posting to a whole new level. It's the dregs of the libertarian movement. Yeah, I mean, not even that. Like, it's uh, it's full on alt right sometimes. Like, <laughs> right. it can be horrible. Right, a horrible place to be on Facebook. James Neese is not welcome there. That that's <laughs> the, that's the point that it got to. Like, he's trying to troll this dude, 
and is like putting pictures of his children oh. in the comments section. And um, one of the admins was like, dude, do you want me to ban this guy? <laughs> like, I'm sitting there watching it as it's all happening, like watching the comments roll in. And I'm like, oh, my God, James Neese is going to get kicked out of Ann Kapistan on Facebook. <laughs> James is a mod on the on B on 4chan, the random board. Like, do you, yeah. know, do you know how powerful you have to be on the Internet to get and how long you have had to have been in the drags of the of yeah. the internet to get that position? Yeah, and see, like that is a, like a totally new thing. Like, you just talk about 4chan with him, and then all of a sudden he'll be like, "Well, yeah, I'm uh, I'm a moderator on the on the B board." And you're like, "What?" <laughs> what? And then I'm talking about Minecraft with him one day, and exp- talk- we're just talking, you know, things that we've built and stuff. And I was like, "So you're you're a regular player too?" Then and he goes. No, I just run a few of the servers. Right. Who is this guy? Like, where did you come from? <laughs> no, that's one of my favorite. Like, James is uh, James is definitely someone that I, I've known since uh, 2010. So I've known James a long time. And James is one of the most successful people I know, one of the smartest people I know, but also one of the worst people I know. <laughs> and he is he is entertaining and hilarious, and I just think, you know, he's – He's kind of going to be the last holdover of my former offensive life because he has a different perspective on almost everything, even if it is just like very bizarre and crass in the presentation. But if you really listen to what James says a lot of times, it really is very intelligent. Like he's a yeah. very smart guy. He's a like really smart guy. He's going to the University of Chicago uh, right now. Like he, it, it's it's his. He's just a mystery wrapped in enigma, wrapped, yeah. wrapped in a riddle. Now he he drove an hour and a half to go eat at a truck stop Indian restaurant with me and Jeremiah and our girlfriends <laughs> in Spiceland, Indiana. Right. Like he's just like it was just a random thing. He just messaged us and goes. Hey guys, you want to go check out that Indian restaurant in Spiceland at a truck stop? Yeah, <laughs> and we're, it's so be we're, good we're though, sitting right? there eating. Yeah, we're sitting there eating. The food is delicious. I've never been there, and it looks so sketchy. And we're eating the food. I'm like, wow, this is surprisingly good for a truck stop, right? And James is like, yeah, I just uh, drove back from Louisville. But, what? <laughs> <laughs> way out of the way. He he apparently like donates sperm. I was going to say, he's been doing a lot of breeding lately, from what I hear. Yeah, he's Jingus Jingus niece. He's like <laughs> literally like the father of 100 people, apparently. <laughs> and counting. Could you what imagine? Was the, what was the story of the one payment? It was like a $25 gift card to Burger King. <laughs> I don't remember Isn't that, that story. I thought that that's, that was on one of the episodes where you guys talked about that with Oh, him. my God. <laughs> well, yeah. You, the niece episodes are worth hearing. You can go back and sort by host uh, at wal.fireside.fm. You, what was your first encounter with Nice, Shane? My first encounter with Nice was actually pretty pretty mellow by all standards for yeah. Nice. We talked a lot of business. <laughs> okay. So, <laughs> surprisingly, I didn't know the other side of it until later. Right, yeah. So he, he looks kind of like Tiny Tim, like Google Tiny Tim. <laughs> Uh, from the Carson years, like, and yeah, he's he's just, I saw him in a three-piece suit, and I was like, look, and he had long hair. He looked just like Tiny Tim, but <laughs> fascinating human being. One time he, he, he got, he's the reason for the no, don't be early to the show rule, which Shane violated tonight and ended up I seeing, violate it every time. And you saw me in my boxers, so I'm sorry about that. I played high school football, it's cool. <laughs> right, but, uh, so thank God it was just boxers, but <laughs> niece, but I was preparing to shower, and he just w- strolls in drinking a 72-ounce cola, sipping on a cola, and I hear somebody come in, so I, and I'm getting ready to get in the shower, so I'm full nude, so I take a, a washcloth, <laughs> put it over all the important parts, walk around the corner, <laughs> cock my fist, ready to hit, and he's like, whoa, dog, whoa. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, that was, uh, he literally sat there. I I am the only person ever to, sh- I had him literally shaking. He was, he was, he, he had to see a counselor afterwards. All right, so may- maybe James will show up here in a little while, uh, but... Good times to be had by all tonight. We're going to talk a little bit about the Libertarian Party. The Libertarian Party uh, did absolutely nothing on Election Day, <laughs> <It's>, <laughs> as it normally does. Uh, and there's there's been some happenings in the Libertarian Party. Uh, I've exchanged some words with the officers of the National Libertarian Party online. 
Uh, so we're going to talk a little bit about that. And then Shane messaged me and said, how do you deal with all this infighting? And so we're going to talk a little bit about infighting. So first, I want to give you a heads up because there are uh, there's a cool feature that I'd like you to try out and check out and see if you like. It's at wearelibertarians.com, and it is We Are Libertarians Radio. And you can get We Are Libertarians Radio, which is a 24-hour, seven-day-a-week stream of every We Are Libertarians episode ever. And it's really cool because you can hear stuff that you probably wouldn't pick if you're just going back through the titles on the RSS feed. And you can get it on TuneIn. It's been added to TuneIn and Apple Radio, so you can hear it on the iTunes desktop app, app uh or you can get it at wearelibertarians.com. It's just really cool. Like I, I heard uh, Joe and I talking about the CPS stealing two children from their parents because they were, they went to the park on their own, and so some neighboring, uh, some neighbor lady called CPS and they scooped the children up and like wouldn't give the parents back the kids back to the parents. So it's really interesting to kind of hear stuff that you wouldn't ordin- ordinarily hear. So check that out. Uh, also want to say. Uh, please, if you are not a subscriber of the show, consider supporting us financially. We give you all kinds of bonus content for $5 a month or more. For 10 bucks, you get access to a special Facebook group where we live stream and you can chat with people. $25 and up, you get a cool poster that I've shipped out, so people should be arriving. Uh, those should be arriving tomorrow for people. And uh, then there's the $100 a month subscribers where you get direct access to me and you get to come on the show after a couple uh, times that we've got three of those people, Craig DaCosta, Jason Doolittle, and Christy Avery. So that money goes towards uh, prep resources, towards uh, all the infrastructure, cool new things like the We Are Libertarians radio. So now when you search libertarians, when you're on TuneIn, you get a, a radio station. Uh, And we're just trying to make this show more accessible to people, make the ideas of libertarianism more accessible to people, and uh, we need your support, so please. I'm also, thanks to our Patreon subscribers, I'm going to be able to go to Porkfest this year and the National Libertarian Convention, so I am uh, 90% sure I'm going to both of those. They're like back-to-back weekends. <laughs> oh, man. So, uh, but I think it'll be fun to go and uh, and see Porkfest and go to the National Libertarian Convention. So hopefully I can see you there. And I can only do that financially because you guys are allowing me to go and report live from the scene, get all kinds of cool interviews, talk to people. And uh, you, you can live vicariously through me if you if you can't join us. But I'd love for you to come and hang out. So thank you to everybody that supports us on Patreon, at, that is uh, patreon.com slash Libertarians, or you can find it at wearelibertarians.com. So, commercial's over. Let's talk about the Libertarian Party. <laughs> um, so, as I ended the show on Thursday, uh, somebody posted in the We Are Libertarians Facebook group, which you can access at the front page of the website, uh, something that the vice chair of the Libertarian Party posts. His name is Arvin Vahora. V- v- Vora. I think, Vora. I think yes. it's Vora. It's yes. Vora. Um, now, let me preface this. Let me say that I am, you know, and I'm holding it up for the, for the camera. I am uh, a Libertarian Party member. I serve on my state central committee, uh, although I will be ending that commitment in April or May. Um. I am not burning my card tonight or anything like that because cut it up. No, nope, not, not going to cut it up on the air. Been a member since 2009. I brought my scissors for nothing. <laughs> yes, nothing. <laughs> uh, so I and I served as the executive director of the State Libertarian Party here in Indiana from 2008 to 2012. So I've been deeply committed for the last 10 years to the Libertarian Party. Um, Part of tonight's show will will document a little bit of my crisis in faith uh, of that organization, uh, and we're going to talk a little bit about that. And uh, so I, I want to be clear that I do support the Libertarian Party, but it is letting me down, and I think that I'm going to speak for a lot of the sentiments that you guys have out there in Radio Land. Uh, and I also want to say that I like Nick Sarwark, and I like Arvin v- Vora. Like, I've met Arvin a couple times. He's always been super nice. Nick and I have had many, many exchanges. He's been on the program. I think, by and large, when it comes to the office, he he has been the best chair in my 10 years in the Libertarian Party in terms of staffing. He's hired a lot of great people. 
He's getting the the staff moving in the right direction. They're doing a lot of good things. But my main my main problem with Nick, it will be highlighted in uh, the story to unfold tonight, which is he just is snarky. <laughs> and I love when Nick is snarky to Republicans and Democrats. But when Nick is snarky to libertarians, I don't get it. Yeah. So and uh, we'll, we'll kind of cover that because some of the fights that he picks just don't make sense now. So we ended the show Thursday, and I see Arvin Vora's uh, Facebook post posted in the We Are Libertarians group. Now, Arvin writes, quote-unquote, guys, we shouldn't speak badly of rapists. Many people rape, and they vote. If we attack them, they might not vote libertarian. That's how some of you sound when you suggest we pander to public school teachers and members of the military, military welfare complex – in order not to lose their votes. Hashtag abolish government schools. Hashtag taxation is theft. Hashtag end the military welfare complex. So I decided, all right, well, there's going to be a lot of discussion around this, and I and this pisses me off, and this is not uh, something that I think the National Libertarian Vice Chair should be saying. So I started up a Facebook Live on the We Are Libertarians Facebook page, and – and you can go back and listen to my comments. I put it in the feed. Uh, not many of you listen to it. So if you don't want to take the time, I'll give you the cliff notes. I, I, I think that it is incredibly insensitive uh, towards victims of rape to use them as a cheap political punchline. And I think that it is not going to endear you to voters, especially female voters, when you uh, – sorry, Nisa is trying to call in. Uh, when you, when you, when you kind of just, when you use rape in a way that that just downplays the severity of that event, that is one of the most traumatic events that any human being can go through, especially in the environment we're going through right now, where you have Harvey Weinstein, Kevin Spacey, and there's a growing sensitivity towards you know using uh, towards sexual violence sexual de like deviancy like towards uh the very unlibertarian idea that you own the body of another person and it just doesn't seem to be good messaging for the the vice chair to compare uh to use rape to make his point but also to in the minds of the people reading it to compare soldiers and teachers to rapists yeah the thing is is we always talk about all the time, and you talk about it a lot too, Chris, is whenever people use horrible things to try and justify their own political ideas and uh, make a political point with something that is, has happened and it's horrible. Right. Just like we were talking about with the Las Vegas shooter and the banning of guns automatically started popping up, right? Right. You, you just don't do that because it's a horrific thing that happened in people's lives. It's emotionally manipulative. Right, and that, that's what Arvin did, is he, he used a horrible thing, one of the most horrible things that can ever happen to a man or a woman, especially women, because it happens more often to them, mm -hmm. and he used it to make a political point about teachers? Like, how, where do you draw that conclusion? Where do you make that connection at? Yeah. I, that's what I don't understand. Right. Well, and we're... Intent matters. A teacher's intent isn't to go in and steal money from the government. Somebody who joins the military is not joining the military to go steal money from the government. A rapist, his intent is to rape and hurt somebody. Right. Yeah. Intent matters. That's as simple as it comes down to. And to compare the two is just horrible. Yeah, and and I should I'm I would be remiss if I didn't ask you to what I shared what position I hold in the Libertarian Party. What position do you guys hold, Dakota? Uh, I'm the uh, I'm the chairman for uh, Henry County, Indiana, which is uh, uh, county number 33. It's my uh, license plate that's coming in. It says 33L1. Because you're uh, the chairman, and yeah. we have special plates for county chairman. <laughs> well, I had to I had to pay the thirty dollars to get it, but right. So that that is a luxury that is not afforded to me by the taxpayers. I still had to pay for it. Right. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I am a county chairman. Um, I do contribute to the 1994 Society for the State of Indiana, and previously I did contribute $15 a month to the National Party. Um, after Arvin's comments on last Thursday, I immediately went through and uh, canceled that $15 membership to the National because it was 
that was enough for me as a county chairman, as a person who it is my ultimate goal in our county to get people elected in positions, to make us a serious force in our political community, which we have it in Henry County. Mm -hmm. It's it's different than other places. We ran a control candidate last year, which was Jesse Riddle as a for county council race. Um, we basically didn't do anything with Jesse. That's why he was labeled the control candidate. Right. So we, we didn't campaign for him. We didn't hand out flyers. We didn't do anything. He went to one town hall, and that was it. And he was 1,800 votes behind one of the winning council members, which is huge. Right. So, I mean, that's that's how things are in Henry County. And I want, as a, the county chairman, to to get somebody elected. And I think that we can. But whenever Arvin made those comments, it made me, a county chairman, embarrassed of the National Libertarian Party and not want to be associated with yeah. them. And we are Libertarians would be happy to take all those monthly donations that you were giving for patrons. <laughs> uh, Shane, you uh, you hold what position in the Libertarian Party? I'm an executive board member for Marion County here right. in Indianapolis. Okay. That's my And you've also run for office? Yes, I ran for state senate last year. Okay, so you, you are two people who, uh, like myself, have given a lot of time, money, and energy towards the Libertarian Party. And we're not here being critical because we're just like the, the type of Libertarians that won't associate with a political party or we're Republican Libertarians who are just bashing the stupidity of the Libertarian Party. Like that's not our goal. Like the point of this episode and, and in being critical, our intent is not to bash the party – but to make it better, and it is it is to make our leadership realize that their voice has lost – A, they've lost confidence in people that should have confidence in them and people that do respect them, but also a, a, a block of voters that I think are going to be turned off by this kind of messaging. Yeah, absolutely. Right. You know, I tell people all the time uh, whenever they – whenever someone complains to me or says something to me like about how I always complain about the government or the th way that things are ran in the government or the things that the government is doing, um, I always say, you know, I love this country, right. and that's why I'm so critical of it. I love this country. That's why I want to see it become better. Right. And that is how I feel about the Libertarian Party. This The party itself and the platform and everything that it stands for is great. Right. Libertarianism as a philosophy is great. That is why I'm critical of it. I, I want nothing but more than to see it succeed. Right. right. Go ahead. Well, for um, basically, I don't know where where Arvin's from, like as far as which state, but I think New York City. I, I think that's he's, what or, I or Virginia. I think I know he's on the eastern coast. Okay. So basically, the way when you grow up in small town Indiana, for instance, a lot of these kids come out of high school and they join the military. They right. don't know any better. They're 18 years old. They're, how are you going to, if they change their mind later and they join the LP and they want to become a candidate and then our vice chair attacks anyone who's a veteran because they took money from. Right. Yeah. I mean, there is a disproportionate amount of lost lives in the Iraq and Afghanistan wars from Indiana. You know, yeah, and right. I had in my in my remarks, I had a lot of and, and, and I went I, I showed our Facebook group. I shared with our uh, Facebook group and on the big page, actually, uh, the realities of what our Facebook page is made up of. I mean, the the amount of people, the top three jobs on our Facebook page of eighty seven thousand people on a libertarian Facebook page. The number one job that our fans have is veterans. Number two is lawyers. And number three is government officials mixed. And then teachers is in there as well. Like people who interact with the government on a daily basis are the first ones to go, government isn't working. What's a better alternative? Right. Yeah. And when you're the vice chair of the party, what, what's the first thing that they see? Uh, rapists, we shouldn't pander to public school, quote unquote, teachers and members of the military welfare complex. A guy that I went to high school with commented, like, I served in the military for 10 years. I fought in Afghanistan. You're going to call me a welfare queen? Like, this is why you guys are losers. I would never support the Libertarian Party now. 
you know? And I, I know I'm always the first to say, like, those kind of people are willing, are, are, are always the first ones to, like, find a reason not to support the Libertarian Party. But we shouldn't be looking to give them the reason not to support yeah, us. Right. And secondly, people who work for the government and collect taxpayer money, yes, they are – how can I say this delicately? Um, I read – I was reading The Anatomy of the State yesterday. I was listening to the audiobook on Audible before I went to Boss Hogg, and I was listening to Anatomy of the State by Murray Rothbard. And he uses the word parasitic because people who collect any kind of government money are taking that money out of the p private sector – and redistributing it somewhere else like your money if you are earning a paycheck or a welfare check or whatever you're getting money from the government it is coming out of somebody else's pocket and that's where taxation is theft comes from it's that very basic idea that you wouldn't walk over and go well i need to pay for my health insurance so i need you to give me money shane right and then you go i'm not going to do that and then i go well you know what dakota has a lot more guns than you so dakota i need you to get the money from shane that i need to pay for my health insurance and so if we wouldn't do it on a one-to-one -one level then why is it moral to do it on a societal level just because right. the group voted to steal your money does that make it more moral not in the view of libertarians so Philosophically, it's not that most or any libertarians disagree with what Arvin is saying. It's the way that he is saying it and the way that it is perceived by the voting public. Because I, it took me four years waking up every morning to work for the Libertarian Party. I didn't get that concept. I went to work for the Advocates for Self-Government, the quiz people, where you know, you're filling out the quiz. It was there. Um, nearly six years into my journey as a libertarian, when I taxation is theft concept and could explain it in a in a in a very coherent way, and when you start out with just a punch in the face, like rapists or soldiers or teachers, you don't get them into that six year process to finally get to that point and then wrestle for themselves whether or not they want to be morally complicit and taking a paycheck from the government and participating in foreign wars. Like, it, it is something that every person needs to decide, but they're never going to get that information if they, at, at their most statist point, are not going to take you seriously. Yeah, and one of the things that a lot of libertarians agree on is that the nation needs to have a defense system. Like, there's, I haven't talked to a single libertarian that has said, yeah, there's no reason we should ever have any sort of military. I I don't I haven't talked to any of those people. I'm sure that right. there are those that exist because I've I've seen the some of the people in our in our circles and how they talk. But I don't I don't think that that is your average libertarian thinking person. Right. Right. And I'm I would go out to say that the average libertarian thinking person doesn't view public schools as evil as well. Right. We are talking about the anarchist faction of the libertarian movement. Right. right. And, Mostly the ones who aren't here to go to meetings or to yeah. help get people elected or to canvas or to yeah. come in and volunteer on a campaign or do anything. They just sit around and they yell at people on the internet <laughs> and because they try don't want to do anything with away. political parties. Right. Because it, they view it as the government, which is evil. Right. Like, and don't get me wrong, the ones that are here and that help out, I love them. Love them today. Right. They're really good people. But some of them are just, they cross lines, and they try to make it harder for everybody else. Do you like freedom or not is essentially what it comes down to. Do you want to start taking steps in the direction of freedom, or do you just want all or nothing? So this is actually uh, a long-running debate in the Libertarian Party be between whether it should be a functional political party that does political action or if it should be an educational organization. And I can see the argument for both sides. Like, my argument is that you do traditional political work, and and that is the way that you educate the voters about libertarian ideas and principles. And I think there are a lot of libertarians who don't want to do the hard work of trying to apply libertarian principles to modern-day politics and policy, which is very difficult, and I devote my entire life to it. Yeah, but I, I also <laughs> think that's incredibly naive. If you're one of those people, that is incredibly naive thinking. And In, in what you, way? 
Because I think if you hold that viewpoint, then which, you... Which viewpoint is what I'm asking the, you? The viewpoint that the Libertarian Party doesn't have a place in modern politics and policy, okay. just in education. Okay. Okay, so I'm that those are the people that I'm addressing. So if you hold that viewpoint, I, I do believe it's incredibly naive because I don't think that that person has a, a whole grasp on everything that government does. Right. Right. So, I mean, and... I'll tell you, like, whenever I first got into this and I started thinking about it, and, you know, every libertarian has that thought, like, yeah, Gary Johnson doesn't stand a chance in hell in winning, right? You have that thought in your head for the entire election. Yeah, Rex Bell is not going to win the governor's seat in the state of Indiana. Like, you know those things come election day, but you also have to realize, like, that's not why you're doing it. You're doing it to influence modern politics. Like, you don't do it... You don't do it just to show people, hey, these are our ideas. You do it so that people will eventually listen. Right. And not just the voter base, but the people who do get elected into those offices. The people like, um, for instance, in uh, for our, the state representative in District 54, uh, which part of Henry County is, we had Zach Lee running and um, against the incumbent Mr. Tom Saunders. Uh, Republican. It was Republican versus Libertarian in that race. Zach Lee ended up pulling 27 percent of the vote. Okay, which was which is huge for a Libertarian candidate, first right. of all. And in rural Indiana, especially. Yeah, and I had a conversation with uh, a family member who said, "You know, you shared all this stuff about Zach Lee, and I really expected him to do better, but I guess he's just like every other Libertarian." Right. And I said, "You you're not getting the point, right?" Because if, you, if you're if you walking away from this thinking, oh, it's just going to be the exact same, then you're wrong. Because Tom Saunders realized, oh, my God, a third-party candidate got over a quarter of my votes. Right. right. Like, I obviously need to listen to some of the things that a quarter of my, of my uh, constituents. constituents. Yeah. Is you or is you ain't my constituents. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, so... That's why I think if you, if you just believe that the Libertarian Party is for educating people on what we believe as a philosophy, then it's it's wrong. You're in right. a, you're in an area of the state, Dakota, where you guys are the second party. The Democrat, yeah. the Democrats don't count there. Right. The Democrats don't put it, people up to run in Henry County. And so, if you want to scare people into, if you want to scare a politician, you've got to run a Libertarian candidate in a two way race that can get democratic votes, can get libertarian votes and can run a good campaign in a in an area of the state of Indiana where Rex Bell as a congressional candidate wins precincts. Yeah. Right. Like we're like a 6th district federal congressional candidate in that part of Dakota in Dakota's county won precincts. Yeah. Beat the Republican and the Democrat because he's spent so much time as a part of his community and people like him, and he's run so— Rex Bell won a township this year. Right. Running right. for governor. And, and a township is like a—there's nine in a county, and yeah. it, it's one of the nine blocks. Like, it's incredibly difficult. He overcame straight-ticket voting because of his personality, his hard work, his effort. Like, he—and I'm seeing from his campaign manager, he won for governor, too. He won precincts as uh, House District 54. Like— the efforts of one man with an army of 12, 15 volunteers over the course of 10 years, 10, five campaigns, was able to set a county, two, three counties up. Yeah. To, to, yeah, to not have just a, Henry County. Not just Henry County, but Wayne County and uh, the one south of that, Blackford. Is it Blackford? Uh, Jay? Uh, but, anyways, um, that one county. Uh, so <laughs> you, you, these rural areas, you, you, we, we are the opposition as the Libertarian Party people. Like right, yeah. in in a in a place where Shane and I live, Shane and I live pretty close here in Indianapolis and in Marion County, which has a million people in it, and the donuts add two and a half. I mean, it's a total of two and a half million people. Like it's pretty tough for us to win precincts here because right. of the po density of the population. But there's not any reason that we can't win township boards, right? I mean, what did – so when you ran as a candidate, what, what did you run for? And did you see – like, 
because w what I maintain is that by doing traditional political politics, by doing door knocking and talking to voters and going to forums and going to m meetings held by the government, going and, and running a Facebook page where you give your opinion on the policies that are relevant to the office you're running for, like these are great educational opportunities for people to see that libertarians are serious that they can win, that they can govern, that they have ideas that are relevant to the voter. I mean, and you ran a campaign like that, Shane. Right. Did you see an educational benefit from running that sort of campaign? Definitely. And to Dakota's point, some of my talking points in our forums got picked up by the person who won. Right. So, I mean, that's a slight step for freedom. We didn't win, but a couple of our viewpoints did. Yeah. And it helped out It a wasn't lot. a total loss. Like, by voting... By wasting your vote, as people like to put it, you have done something. Right. You know, it wasn't, it's not a total loss if you vote for the guy that doesn't win. Right. Right. It shows what we're looking for as a society. We don't want to be ruled over. We want freedoms back. We, we want to do it ourselves. Right. And, uh, yeah, I mean, and I think that if you had started from the point of view of anarcho-capitalism, it, it it wouldn't have worked. It wouldn't have, especially in my area. My area is very split. It's uh, about a 60-40 split mm -hmm. between Republican and Democrat. So I can pull a lot of my talking points and pull votes in whichever area I need to. As far as if I want to talk about social issues, there's sections of my district that that works out very well. And there's sections that work talking about fiscal conserva right. conservatism. and. Yeah, so it, it we just have a philosophical difference when it comes to the leadership and, and what works here in Indiana, which has traditionally been one of the strongest states in the entire uh, Libertarian Party because it, it basically runs on these principles, which is do traditional politics, that you need to be a part of your community. Here's how you win an election. Let me Let me explain to you how to win an election. Okay, it doesn't matter what party you're in. Here's how you win. You spend years being... A, a, a net positive for your community by giving your time to local charities, local civic groups. You show up to city council meetings. You get to know the politicians. You have thoughtful discussions with politicians. You influence their decisions. You uh, hold them accountable in, in, in a respectful way. You, uh, you know, you do it disrespectfully sometimes if they really need a wake up call or somebody's very you know you got to get attention for the issue you run multiple cycles you start at the lowest level possible you run at that lowest level race possible until you pick till you win or you pick up a significant base and then you start moving up here's how to lose an election you and in all of that you do you the campaigning that you do is door knocking mailers facebook advertising to some extent uh but mostly door knocking and direct mail it's making sure people know your name exactly whenever right. they go to the ballot box so when they get the mailer they go oh that's the very thoughtful person that i met a year ago at a, a civic forum they were very smart i'm going to vote for them not who is this stranger here's another piece of junk it is about developing relationships with your community here's how to lose an election you raise a hundred dollars you have no volunteers except for maybe the two or other two other people in your county party you uh, never do a single thing that resembles electioneering or campaigning you go to the televised debate in a hawaiian shirt to get attention <laughs> and you uh, you say the most offensive things you can to get attention. Uh, basically, I, I guess I should be honest. <laughs> there, he did get elected president, so maybe I'm full of shit. <laughs> but um, now that I'm saying this, but it, it, Trump just doesn't work for local races. And, no, uh, absolutely not. Unless you own the city. You're, and you know, we, right. if you employ half the city, you're you can not, get the vote. You're not Donald Trump. And, and see, But that's something that we've seen happen more in like this uh, 2017 elections and uh, even candidates that have already announced for the 2018 elections is people acting more ballsy like right. Trump was, you know, it's like he, it's like he uh, introduced this, this modern era 
of I'm just going to talk to you people like I'm on the internet. Right. You know, and I, you're absolutely right, Chris. Right. It's not going to work for modern politics. It worked for uh, the national politics. It worked for uh, Donald Trump because the American people view the federal government so out of touch with reality and so out of touch with anyone in the voter base that they they saw a guy who was up there and just didn't care. Right. And it was automatically attractive. Right. right. Well, and everybody knew his name beforehand. He owns- Yeah. Well, it was that he was authentic. Right. And libertarians can be authentic and be real and be different and not be part of the swamp. And that's what was attractive about Trump. What isn't attractive about Trump is his crassness. It is what turns people off. And I think that uh, not only here on our show, I, I, I p- part of me loves him for his blatant shit posting, but the other part of me is just totally <laughs> turned off and tired of it. Like, I'm exhausted by it. And so I wonder realistically how how long that will actually last. Like, will people uh, reelect him? because of that but i can i can tell you with 100 percent certainty that doesn't work at a local level like you cannot win an election on a hundred dollars with two volunteers never knocking on a door like just because your friends come up to you and say i'm voting for you and a lot of people say they're voting for you you have to realize most of those people are lying to your face and people are nice they're polite you, right. you you probably shane the first time you run for office going into the election you're just like i've got this in the bag Oh yeah, definitely. Why? Why do you feel that way? Everybody that I talk to seemed to like me, right? <laughs> and you talked to a lot of people, right? I did, yes. And they were all voting for you. Yeah, definitely. And how many? How did you do? <laughs> <laughs> I got about five percent. <laughs> okay, which isn't in isn't a three way ba- race. In yeah, a three way race, bad. Yeah. not bad. But uh, what are some other things that you learned as you were running for office? Um, just as far as people want everything directed. At them individually. So individual conversation works, but it's very hard to reach out to every single person, especially if you're in an area, like Chris said, where we're talking to 100,000 people. Right. It's impossible to talk to every single person face-to-face. So in your messaging, you have to be be clear and concise and try to hit the points. So most areas will have a couple issues that they deem as important just in general if you can focus on those issues the people feel like you're talking to them because it's an issue that matters to them right that was probably the biggest takeaway from it and something that we need to focus on rather than pointing out if i want to go in and say the roads were a big issue this year that was what a lot of people brought up roads and crime (laughs) were the two biggest so if i go in preaching about how we need to completely get rid of I don't know, the Federal Reserve or whatever, it's not going to resonate with these people here. The people want to know what your stances are on the issues that are important to them. And if you're running for a county office and one of your talking points is legalizing marijuana, what are you doing? Yeah. You know, like it just doesn't work just because and that's that's the problem with most of the Libertarian Party. And, And I don't mean the Libertarian movement. I mean, the Libertarian Party specifically. It is a problem in the Libertarian Party. It doesn't happen as much in the Republican Libertarian wing because they they are around effective people. The Libertarian Party is just not effective. And to be quite honest, I have a hard time sitting here behind this microphone saying that it's really worth a lot of your time. Like if you're in a part of if you're in a part of the country like where Dakota's at and you have a real shot at making a difference or if you are willing to invest the time in your in your local local community like Shane is doing, as as a business owner, going to events, going to not just Libertarian Party events. Like I see so many Libertarian Party people only going to Libertarian events. It's like a social club with the least social people on the planet. <laughs> like it's like you go and hang out, and it's just like, why aren't we growing? It's because we don't do anything that actually affects anything, and so yeah. it just becomes political masturbation. And you build this little <laughs> echo chamber where you you elect a person to vice chair who says guys we shouldn't speak badly of rapists and also let's not pander to public school quote-unquote teachers and members of the military welfare complex yeah what arvin is saying there is i don't care about anybody but arvin 
Right. And the the very small group of people that follow me and I am speaking to my base in the libertarian movement of 57 people in, yeah. in a Facebook group called the Radical Caucus. Like, you don't get it. You're not actually doing anything that is ingratiating people to the libertarian party and the libertarian movement. All you're doing is making us look like we don't care about people. And right. it shows a complete but, lack of but empathy. But the philosophy right. behind that is that the, uh, it's the Miley Cyrus it's the Miley Cyrus viewpoint and mm -hmm. her her shot at marketing where there's no such thing as bad pu publicity. Right. You right. know, she starts like all, all of a sudden her career is in the trash, right? So now she starts taking off her shirt and saying hashtag free the nipple right. or right. and twerking on Robin Thicke whenever he's seen, right. you know, and that that shot her back up into the to the limelight. Now she's a, a judge on the voice, you know, and right. that that's. That is Arvin's philosophy, the same as Miley Cyrus. And he, to where he thinks, if I can say these outlandish things and garner some attention from maybe one mainstream media outlet, hey, look at what the Libertarian National Vice Chairman said, then it's going to attract maybe some of those people that aren't interested in political parties. That is that is his thought process behind right. all this. Right, right. But you're going to pull in the same people who have that viewpoint already, who are the same people that don't show up to any events or even yeah. vote for most of them. It, right. So it's not so, going to matter. So it's right. a completely ineffective. It's they're, a complete wash. They're good libertarian club members. Right. But w this is not a libertarian club. This is supposed to be a political party. Yeah, they're good for groups like Ancapistan, and that's about it. Right. right. So I, I just – I have to say, and I have to be real honest here, um, you know, Indiana's fortunate that there are a lot of motivated people – and a big part of the problem right now is recruitment. It's really hard to get people to – Shane and I were talking about the future of our local county party. There, you know, there's not a lot of people on the bench, and that wasn't that way, you know, six years ago. Even it, last year. Even last year. Uh, part of it is that it's an off year, right. and, and it's not – next year more people will show up. But you've got to be effective in identifying the people that are worth your time and worth your party's time. And what libertarians do is that when anybody shows up, they immediately put them in a leadership role, and that's not what you want to do. You can't put people in leadership roles who don't belong in leadership roles. There are some people that just – there are some people that don't belong in your party. Like I still am suffering the effects of kicking Melissa Donahue out of the Libertarian Party of Indiana. <laughs> Like, n <laughs> like I did. I have done a lot for the Libertarian Party Spanking of India. Spanking City Hall, baby. Nobody did more for the LPIN uh, between 08 and 12. I'm, I'm just gonna say it, and it's not humble, but it's true. And <laughs> none of that mattered when I told one insane, crazy woman who was bad for the brand to leave and don't come back. Such a nasty woman. I was, I was the one that was the bad guy in, in that situation. So. You know, and that's when it, all these people go, well, this is just not the, the, the way that it works uh, because I left the Republican or Democratic Party because of this kind of thing. It's like, you know what, this is politics. So it, it goes to the, to the question that you had of infighting, right. uh, Shane, where you, you asked me what in a Facebook message prompting me to invite you here. Right. What was your question? So I basically asked how you deal with infighting. It gets so time consuming whenever I'm trying to do other things. I'm, right. I'm trying to start up a business. I'm trying mm -hmm. to do my job during the day. I'm trying to raise my family. I just got married recently. I have a lot going on. Right. The time that I have available that I'm spending with the LP, I don't want to spend it fighting my own people. Exactly. I want to spend it fighting the opposition and growing the par growing the party and growing the movement. Right. Uh, so how do I handle it? I... I, uh, I ignore it or I engage in it selectively. Uh, I, I've never been critical of a candidate, ever. But when Jim Wallace was running for governor in 2012 against Rex Bell, who, as we said in, earlier in the program, was one of the most successful candidates in Libertarian Party That's history. Amazing. And is Which a great is human why being. Why I am a part of the Libertarian Party. Right. And many others. Well, let's not, uh, let's, let's not say that too loudly. Uh, we're trying to promote uh, lead, leadership. Uh, I guess we are. I'm yeah. Just kidding. Uh, no, I, so <laughs> versus a guy who Jim has, and I know he doesn't like people bringing this up and I don't blame him has been, uh, arrested twice 
with two different wives for domestic violence. And in the game of politics, it doesn't matter whether he's innocent or not. It's that he was arrested twice. And the, the Republican state party here had commercials written bashing him if they needed to be. And, and Greg basically made a meme saying exactly what those thing, exactly what those commercials said. And we were the bad guys for posting that. But it was to see what Jim Wallace would do with it, what the party would do with it, and all they did was cry about it, as opposed to saying, how do we handle this? And, and, it, and it was a moment of great infighting that I caused. But I did it for a reason, because the party sometimes needs infighting, because you need to say, uh, our, our gubernatorial candidate can't have this kind of record. Uh, this volunteer is very hurtful to our reputation and to retention for good volunteers. She needs to go. So sometimes infighting, I think, has to be done. It has to be healthy. I think infighting is a smear word when, when in reality it's policing the organization. Like, are you going to run an effective organization or not? Sometimes volunteers have to be fired in an effective organization. But for the most part, and you know what? Since then... Since that that woman is not a part of the party, think of how peaceful it's been. You know, there's somebody like uh, th there's a person here in the county named Angela that that uh, she and I have gone back and forth, and she was the campaign person for for the gubernatorial campaign. We had a lot of conversations, uh, and you know, it wasn't infighting; it was respectful conversation about right. strategy. And uh, it's because we didn't make it personal. It just wasn't personal between her and I. I, uh, you know, it's sometimes hard to like be an adult and not let it go there, but you've got to like maintain that decorum. And I think it, it comes down to every individual. You you need to be an adult. And a lot of libertarians are very passive aggressive. They'd rather take passive aggressive, indirect shots you know, on Facebook or email threads or in person, as opposed to just going up to the person and saying, hey, you're supposed to be a leader. I didn't like what you did or did not do. Okay, well, let's have a conversation about that. And uh, then let's have a public conversation about that. You know, uh, and, and, I've, and I've been, I've had to learn this the hard way because I've not always been good at that. But infighting, I think, is uh, sometimes the word is used to get people to stop having Facebook fights, to when sometimes those arguments, those conversations that are taking place are healthy. Right. And it's because libertarians don't, are so embarrassed and so insecure about their place in the political spectrum that they don't have the confidence to have public discussions like the other two parties do. And I get that, but you also kind of need to get over it. Yeah. Like, like the conversation on this podcast about Arvin's comments and Nick Sarwark is respectful and i don't need to have a private conversation with them because they have chosen the mantle of leadership and i have been given a voice by our audience so we're going to have a public conversation about it could i get on here and like rip arvin and be be petty about it of course i could but like you know and arvin and nick to their credit uh well to arvin's credit you know didn't didn't really fire back uh, and he could have easily just gotten on there and, you know, you're a fat and blah, blah, blah. <laughs> like, <laughs> but he didn't do that. And then had several follow-up posts explaining his position. Like, that's, that's a conversation. That's yeah. healthy. That's not infighting. Right. That's saying, I don't like what you did. I think you should resign. I don't think that you should be in your position. Right. Well, here's why I think I should be in my position. Here's what I believe. Yep. You know, what I don't find beneficial is a uh, lot and of— he was watching the live stream. Absolutely. By the way, like just yeah. so everybody knows, yeah, right. He was he was watching. He heard it live as you were saying it, right? And still chose not to back himself up in any way, right? Meanwhile, the the chairman Nick Sarwark chose not to take that route. He chose the route of the least common denominator, as he has so often done. And I made a comment in the live stream, which is probably what made him mad, which would make me mad, but it's the truth. I made the comment that, like Trump, Nick and Arvin should have their Twitters taken away because they keep saying things on social media that do nothing but hurt the party as opposed to grow the party. And I think a lot of it is strategic, and I'll explain why I know that, because it's basically public record. Um, but Nick had some snarky comment and then uh, said this, 
Gregory Lenz for vice chair. Nick knows very well what's going on, and the uh, hurtful, <laughs> uh, basically traumatic situation that's gone on. I'm sure it's hurtful for Greg. Um, it's hurtful for me. The listeners don't like it. It's not something that I really want jabbed at, and that I appreciate. I don't appreciate somebody that I thought was a friend saying something like that. Like that's not cool, Nick. And then I wrote back, I see Patty Nick Sarwark is out tonight, in which he wrote, the new We Are Libertarians reboot with extra sanctimonious fire. You know, and what, what did that do for Nick? That took somebody who is often one of the few defenders of Nick and turned him into somebody that doesn't want to defend him anymore. And one, that person is somebody with an audience of thousands of people who are Libertarian Party members. Like, when I took a poll in our, in our Facebook group, the majority of the people that took that poll, A, were Libertarian Party people, and B, were being detained. Yeah. Christy, Avery, <laughs> Christy keeps running every poll with, am I being detained? Um, so, you know... I think it's funny, though, because that is always, like, the winning answer. I know. Right. <laughs> so, you know, the, the Trump-style politics just doesn't really work in close quarters. And turning your guns on Tom Woods, who is the biggest libertarian podcaster, having a fight with uh, Jason Stapleton, the second biggest podcaster, and then starting a fight with, I'd say we're the third biggest libertarian podcast. Uh, we're certainly growing. We're the fastest growing. Like, why would you pick a fight with somebody that you could easily just say, oh, let's talk about your concerns, you know, or can I come on and let's have a discussion about this? Because yeah. I would absolutely, after the Tom Woods thing, I sent a private message to both Tom Woods and Nick and said, do you want to come on? And Nick brushed me off and uh, Tom Woods didn't respond. So, you know, I, I, I'm willing to have them on to have these conversations, but it, 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 that, Invite gets less and less appealing with every Greg Lenz for chair type comment, you know, so it's it's unbecoming of the chairman of the party to poke a fight with somebody who, you know, is like I'm on the cusp of whether or not I want to be a libertarian party member, like because I just have a hard time justifying my time to be a part of something that I don't think is that effective. Is it effective? Absolutely in some ways, like in the way that you talked about, you know, influencing the people who do win. But sending my audience off to hang out with three other libertarians once a month who are ineffective and turn other people off and then no political action is going to happen in the local area, like why would I want to recommend that you waste your time like that? Yeah. You know, I mean, there, there are places where, like Henry County, where it can be effective, but Showing up to a meeting once a month with other libertarians and it's the same faces every time, year after year, like, how effective is that? It's not really that effective. And so is that the best use of your time when there are many other organizations and outlets that are, that are deserving of your money, like we are libertarians, <laughs> or FEE, or uh, Freedom's Future Foundation, or Cato, or Reason, like... Take your twenty five dollars a year. Don't send it to National. Buy a subscription to Reason. Like, or start going to your right. to your city council meetings, it's your county great. council meetings. Like, that is something actually important, and it's something that like, I one of the things that I encourage people to do all the time is go to go to your local government meetings. Meet the people who represent you. Know who know which ward you're in for your city council, and know who your city council member is. And go talk to them. I mean, they're not, they're in that position for a reason, and they're not just going to shoo you away. Right. Like, I, I just recently started going to our city council meetings in Newcastle um, because of a couple of issues that I, frankly, rubbed me the wrong way. And I, so I went and I had to make my position known. Um, a lot of those people actually recognized me from the Boss Hog of Liberty podcast, which was incredible for me. Like, that was, like, right. I felt like I was on a pedestal, <laughs> like a celebrity status in Newcastle, Indiana. <laughs> and so I'm, but once you, once you talk to these people, and I think that, my point is that I think that the average person 
views their people in government, views their elected representatives in government as just this far off person right. who is morally corrupt. Right. And it doesn't matter what what point in government you are, every person just automatically thinks politicians are corrupt. Right. If you know, that's why the uh, that's why the quote if a politician's mouth is moving, he's lying. That's why that resonates with so many different people. Once you start going to your county council meetings or your city council meetings, you meet and you have conversations with the people who represent you in local government is whenever you start to you start to realize and take in the facts that hey, my my city council member Mark Coger, he's just a regular person. Right. He is a guy just like me who has his own standards, he has his own morals and I shouldn't be demonizing him just because he has a different opinion than me. Right. You know, that that is one of the main the main things that I think people need to focus on. Well, and we I think all have can, opinions. We yeah. all have a million different opinions that can change at any given time and they can be yeah, and swayed I, that's in any direction. I, that's why I, I think that the Libertarian Party has merit to it. Right. Because if you go to a city council meeting and you want to talk about, like, a, the reason that I started going was because they were proposing a smoking ban on all uh, city-owned property. And I was vehemently opposed to that. So I started going, started having these conversations. And, like, you don't even – you don't have to be a county chairman. You can just go there. My name's Dakota Davis. I'm, I'm a member of the uh, Henry County Libertarian Party. Right. And you state your opinion. Right. And you don't even have to say that you're a member of the Libertarian no, Party. Just go it, in as a person and say, look, this is important to me. Yeah. And if you plead your case, it's the same thing. You don't have to attack people to get noticed. You can go out with you and present your ideas and your morals and show them to the people. And most of the, t- most of the time, people are going to appreciate the realness of it. And they're going to take it into consideration. Yeah. If you come out and say you're a rapist, nobody's going to do that. Yeah, and you're never going you're to go. Automatically being attacked. You're never going to go into your county council chamber or your where your city council meetings take place. You're never going to go into one of those two rooms and be the only person that holds that opinion. Right. That's never going to happen. You might be the only person in there that um, identifies with libertarianism as a philosophy or as a political party, but you're not going to be the only one that has that idea. Right. And that's what's so important. Is it? That's why I think you should say I am with the Libertarian Party of Henry County because all of a sudden someone just hears a Libertarian idea for maybe the first time that they've seen it outside of Facebook. Right. And they think, wow, I agree with that. And it's not somebody screaming at them about their nap that they don't understand yeah. or <laughs> anything like that. Right. It's... Or they call a public school teacher a rapist. Right. You yeah. It's, it's ridiculous to think that what so Chris, you're in the uh social marketing world, right? Right. How often does uh just putting you're a racist on top of your marketing material, how often does that work? It doesn't work ever. <laughs> and, I mean it's like it, it, look at how people view social justice warriors. Like, have you ever looked at Carl the Cuck or Aid Skrillex or you know, like some of these other SJW people and gone, you know, I really want to hang out with them. Right. Yeah. Like, regular people <laughs> don't want to hang out with them. Regular people don't want to go out and, like, get offended by everything. And I cannot recommend the Jamie Kilstein episode of Joe Rogan enough. Right. Because he's spending uh, some time talking about the mistakes that he made and how you get into this echo chamber of constantly being offended by everything. And you just turn you just turn into this person where it's just like... You're trying to offend the other side and make them pissed off, and it's just like an unhealthy life that you're living. And like, what what Arvin is advocating and what Nick is living is just like an an untenable way of life. That trust me, fellas, <laughs> like it, it's something that I've really been thinking a lot about. Like, do you really want to wake up every morning and open up your Twitter and just see how awful of a person you are because you've developed this? culture of of just like shit posting like right. that's 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 a big reason like i i you know i'm friends with the barstool heartland guys like barstool sports a lot of our listeners are probably familiar with it 
and it's very popular in the college age male crowd and it's like ball busting and it's just like my friends that work for barstool heartland you google their twitter handle and just look at what they have to read every time they open up their social media because that's the combative culture that they that their media outlet builds and like i didn't want to head that route because i don't want to have a, a culture in our community of we are libertarians of our co-hosts where it's combative and nasty and like just a just an unpleasant thing to be a part of and that's a huge problem with the libertarian party and judd weiss in his interview with tom woods uh really nailed it when he talked about the fact that the culture of the libertarian party is just like an awful dog kennel where you just have these little puppies thrown in with these coyotes and they have to fight for their life because everybody's just attacking each other and then no wonder people bounce after a year or two of being active like you really believe in the ideas you really believe in the third party option but you don't believe in the people that are in the trenches with you and it, it, and the culture of the libertarian party has to change and uh you know i've i've thought like i want to be a part of that that's why i served on this term of the scc but i i just don't i think i can be more effective by doing it here than being a part of the libertarian party and being an active leader in the party and encouraging people here like join whatever party you want be be uh, engaged in whatever political action you think is best but do it in a way that is emotionally and politically healthy for yourself and for the libertarian movement because what the culture sucks and it's not fun it's not a fun thing to be a part of like nobody wants to spend their time in something that isn't fun like yeah. do you think it's fun to open up your facebook page and see the national chairman contributing to that bad culture it starts at the top right you know it, everything trickles down. It, it trickles down and so the trumpian you know we shit like, travels downstream boys <laughs> like i'd love for him to go after the left and the right and i know that doesn't get him as much uh conversation as st picking a fight with tom woods or chris spangle but like dude it's it's not it's not going to help your cause when you go to new orleans next year and people are ready to vote you out and you've activated the mises caucus and the mises people are way bigger than any of us in the in the libertarian movement you've got the libertarian pragmatic caucus has now been formed like you've got people starting to rally against you when you really could have been one of the more popular, more effective party chairs if you had just been more decent, you know? And that's, that's really a sad legacy to leave. Those moments where you pick fights are what will be your legacy as opposed to the great people that you're hiring to run the office, the, the actual gains that you're starting to make. Right. Like it, it's the culture that you leave behind that matters. And, you know, having been a leader in the Libertarian Party, I felt that my main duty was to leave a culture that was a winning culture that of well-trained people, of leaders that were going to carry on for, you know, the next few years. And, and I hope I did well at that. But, yeah, you, you know, no one ever remembers the good things right. that you, any person does. And... See, I don't remember where this quote comes from. It might have been in a book or a movie or something that I read or watched. And it was somebody telling another person, it doesn't matter how many good things you do for a person, as soon as you mess up one time, that is what they remember you for. Right, it's the whole, what have you done for me lately? Yeah, yeah. Not, these... it doesn't matter what you did in the past. And I think that's what Chris is trying to, trying to hit on with Nick. It, right. it doesn't matter what good things he's done. Because the only things that people are going to remember whenever they go to New Orleans to vote is him and his Trump-esque appearance on Twitter and Facebook. Right. Right. Well, and then you have to look at it for the attack dogs that are out there that are just trying to go out and start these fights. What kind of a benefit does an anarchist have attacking a minarchist? Right. What kind of ground is there yeah. to gain? Why not go after... There's a plethora of communists online <laughs> right. that would love your attention <laughs> exactly, and right. would love to fight with you all day long. Right. If you just want to pick fights, like there's plenty of leftists who will do that with you. Oh, yeah. yeah. Why so, do you have to do it why, internally? So here... And I, I will put the link to this because I think you, what you need to understand is this is a coordinated effort by the... the like, Arvin has had a strategy... And Nick, I think 
is implicit uh, is complicit in it because by saying nothing and never reining in this kind of conversation and never uh never like not the fact that neither of them had an issue and doubled down on the fact that rape was used as a uh, uh, political outreach tool, like tells me that these guys are bad marketers. Like they don't understand how to market a product. And, you know, even if they were good at marketing, what is the product that the libertarian party is selling? Like, if you look at the vote totals the other night, uh, let's look at, uh, let's see. Um, uh, Utah third district. Utah is a very strong libertarian state. Uh, John Curtis won in the third district, the Republican with 58.6% of the vote, the Democrat with 26%, the UUT. I don't know what that is. A third party, uh, 9%, the independent 2.6% libertarian got, uh, John Joe Buckman got 2.2% and, uh, the independent American party got 1.5%. So you came in one, two, three, four, fifth in a race of sixth. In the New York City mayor's race, you had de Blasio winning with 66%, which I can't believe. Yeah. Um, Nicole uh, somebody, the Republican, it's a very Greek name that I'm not going to pronounce right, 28%. Sal Albanese with the Reform Party, 2.1%. Akeem Browder, the Green Party, one4 Michael Tolkien, Independent, 1%. Bo Deedle, who's basically a joke, a Fox News joke got 1%, and Aaron Comey, the Libertarian, got 0.2%. So he, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7th place with 2,500 votes. Bo, Bo Deedle got 10,000 votes, and Bill de Blasio got 700,000 votes. So we're not competitive. And so why? Because there isn't a good product to sell. The voters are not hearing a message that resonates with them. They're hearing rape. They're hearing teachers suck. They're hearing soldiers suck. Like, that's not a winning message. That's not anything that is relevant to the lives of the people you're trying to get to vote yep. for you. And so when you have a vice chair and a chair advocating for this kind of messaging, you get seventh place with 2,500 votes. That's 7,500 7, votes. You got 7,000 less votes than sixth place. And so even if they were good at marketing – they would fail because nothing makes a good a bad product fail faster than good marketing like there's the libertarian party doesn't understand what it, it exists for does it exist for education or does it exist for political action and so i think if you're a libertarian party member you really need to decide what you what side you're on and start figuring out what you want your party to be and then start being a leader for that position as Arvin has done, Arvin has picked his side, and let me ex let me show you how this is all calculated. Okay, so there is a list, a list serve every communication, every board meeting, everything in the Libertarian Party is broadcast and public, because the Libertarian Party. What happens is people leave the Republican Democratic Party and say we're not going to do things the way that they did it. And so we're going to have transparency and we're going to do this. And it just, you know, thank God nobody cares about the Libertarian Party because you'd have all the state secrets right there out in the, in the open, <laughs> which is insane. But there's a list serve and you can read all these conversations. The only times that things are actually private are in something called executive session. My sources tell me that there was actually an executive session about Arvin's comments and Arvin's strategy and the social media presence of the Libertarian Party. I do not know what was said with inside of that executive session because it's a private conversation. They wouldn't tell me. But uh, so there has been a conversation amongst the national leadership around this. But uh, and I'll post this link and you can read what the LNC members, which is the national governing body of the Libertarian Party, what they all how they all responded to this, including our own Brett Bittner and our good friend Sam Goldstein participated in this thread. Uh, so this is January 1st, 2017. And he says it to the listserv uh, and he writes. If 2016 showed us one thing, it's that timid positions are neither necessary nor effective in current politics. Our current platform is designed to technically be accurate while not scaring anyone too badly. This is a losing proposition, a clear, 
inspiring, and immediately comprehensible platform is far better than the fine print pretending to be marketing we have now. Take the education plank, for example. And education for Arvin is a real hot topic. Like, he's real into ending government schools, which we all are. We get it, bro. Uh, take the education plank, for example. Education is best provided by the free market, achieving greater quality, accountability, and efficiency with more diversity of choice. Recognizing that the education of children is a parental responsibility, we would restore authority to parents to determine the education of their children without government interference from government. Parents should have control of and responsibility for all funds expended for their children's education. What it means? Eliminate all public schools. Let people choose between free, world-class, online offerings, homeschooling, and private education in any form. Intrans intransigent supporters of public schools won't be fooled by the current, current obfuscation. Opponents and potential opponents won't be inspired. Our job is to convince people of our positions not to mask our positions and pander in order for people to be able to be convinced of our positions. First, they must understand what the position is. I intend to support people for platform committee who will commit to an honest, comprehensible, fearless platform in liberty. Uh, the email thread is enough fo pussy footing around. Now, I don't disagree with him in that the platform is written to be vague and not turn anyone on or off. And that is because the platform doesn't matter. <laughs> Nobody <laughs> cares about a platform. Nobody cares about bylaws. Nobody cares about Bittner. That is why I am against all three. Like, the <laughs> idea that you would Adamantly. You'd stack the platform committee is so useless. It's so pointless. And it's these people who are in our party who just, like, the, the political masturbators who, like, care about the party platform don't get it. Like, they would rather argue about the philosophical points of a platform than to go out and knock on a door and convince people to be a libertarian. Now, Arvin does a lot of good work. Okay, Arvin has a podcast. Arvin has run for office. Arvin has supercharged the social media. Like Arv, for for every bad post that you've heard about, Arvin has really done a great job of building a, a, a platform in the, this in the uh, digital space. Uh, we I may not like a lot of the content, and you might not either, but he has has at least been effective in growing a mess like a messaging platform. Whereas there was not one before, now there is one. It's just the messaging isn't good and isn't effective. That's, but Arvin took them to the promised land and may need to step back. But, so, let me just be clear. Arvin has done some good things. Arvin is not wrong in that the platform is vague. But I'm going to punch you in the face is basically what he's saying. Right. Well, and even in that, there's a good chunk in the middle of that uh, email thread that makes a lot of sense. And if he would have put that in a Facebook post, nobody would have come down on him. But comparing rapists to teachers right. is a completely different thing than saying what he wrote in that email. Right. And that's where the issues come in. And you have to recognize that as a leader. It's your job to lead your people. Yeah. You know, you don't do that with, well, if you don't do this, you're a rapist. Right. I mean, but Arvin, but essentially what Arvin is saying is, we're an education organization, and our job is to build a platform that is clear, that people can grab onto, and if they just read the ideas of liberty through the Libertarian Party, they will be inspired to vote for us. That's not how this works. They want to vote for candidates. Candidates are what matter, not what platform, not what platform you have. Like Candidates are your salespeople. Your job as the vice chair is to build a, a network of, recruit, of recruitment. Like, recruiting is all that a state, national, local party should be doing. They should be recruiting candidates. They should be recruiting new leaders. Like, that is the only function of these state, local, and national parties, along with ballot access. Like, keep the lights on. Your job is not to teach people libertarianism. Your job is to recruit. And that's what he doesn't get, is that you, you – like, nobody will ever go really read the platform and do anything with it, even if it's clear and concise, because – the Libertarian Party is not a political is not an educational organization. This we are libertarians is an educational organization. That's why I do this. That's why there's resources on the website to teach you libertarianism. That's why there's guides to the libertarian movement. That's why there are 
245 episodes now teaching you libertarianism, trying to get you inspired to get active. That's what we do here, and we're really good at it. We're way better at it than you are, Arben. Like, that's why our, our listenership is nine times the size of the National Libertarian Convention, because we're good at it. That's why our monthly net on Patreon is bigger than my state parties take, because we're good at education. The Libertarian Party is not. So if you're being ineffective at it, stop. Start doing your job, which is recruiting good candidates, which you're failing at which is why we're getting 7,000 less votes than sixth place in New York City, which I would yep. imagine is probably a fairly libertarian place if they heard our message, if they heard what that candidate stood for. So, you know, I've been known to be wrong, but I don't think I'm wrong about this because I've done no, this I, for 10 I, years. I totally either, agree with yeah. you, Chris. Yeah, that you couldn't have put that any better, honestly. I... I I mean it's like just like I said before the the party is a party like it's a political party and if we want to market ourselves as that which we are just by running people in elections like right. that is what people see they don't see school of libertarian thought whenever we run a person for the governor of the state of Indiana you know that then obviously you're doing something wrong by by forcing it in another direction like that right it just seems so counterintuitive and so obvious to me sitting here talking about it and i mean it's like you said i i could be totally wrong but it sure feels like i'm right right yeah it's it's crazy that it it goes this long it's been going on this long and it goes this far right it shouldn't even be a question on if we should compare teachers and military to rapists that shouldn't that should never cross your mind right yeah and it just so happened like today as i was you know how it shows you like your memories on facebook now right so i guess last year the gary johnson campaign had put out a picture talking about military members and it just so happened like it came across my timeline today which is hilarious because i was coming on this podcast and i knew what we were talking about mm -hmm. but it was uh, an image that they shared that said if only military men and women were allowed to vote in the upcoming election, Gary Johnson would win by a landslide. Right. right. So think that. Think yeah. about that for a second. And then our national vice chairman compare them to rapists. Like, I think in military, he got 33% of the votes in the military. Yeah. Is now, that right? And, and let me be clear. I don't feel like Arvin's intention was to say that they're rapists. Like, that's a simplification, but it is the simplification that I think the person who is in the military or a teacher or is a loved one of one of those people, that is the leap that I think they would make. Right. Yeah. Well, and it's, it's meme culture. Right. You get six words. That's right. what you have to define your stance. Exactly right. And it should not be that. Yeah. All right. So let's start wrapping up. Can you believe it's been an hour and a half? Has it has really? It has. Yeah. We're just having fun tonight. Right. We're flying through. Just ranting. Just ranting. like every week on Boss Hog of Liberty. That's right. It just goes by. <laughs> Uh, so, final thoughts for this episode. Uh, let's start with uh, Dakota. Well, my final thought is that my sister is going to school to be a public educator. Mm -hmm. And I don't think that she compares in any way to a rapist. Uh, would like to put that out there. No. And uh, <laughs> she just does duck face selfies. That's yeah. all she's. That's all you're, she you're does. friends with her on Snapchat, right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I'll, make, I'll make sure to tell her to listen to this episode. And yeah. At the, Tell me at what the she end. thinks. She, I, I'm surprised that you don't follow her. I really don't. I don't think that she follows me either. Are you guys just not a loving family, or we're we're really not that close of a family? Uh, okay, it, it's not like the morals over yeah. there. Yeah, that's a lot of togetherness. Those people, yeah. <laughs> like they enjoy each other's company. And listen, I love Paul and Joyce, and I love uh, Danny, and I love Hannah, and Jer's great, but they spend a lot of time together. Uh, you guys didn't laugh at my joke. I guess I didn't sell it right. But no, I, I'm like you. My family's like yours, Dakota, where it's like there's not a lot of togetherness. There's a lot of separateness. And then yeah. once a month, we might get together. Yeah, we'll get together and we'll have a good time. Right. Like, we all enjoy each other's company. But like, my whole 20s, we it. didn't even enjoy each other's company. It wasn't until we had the two nieces. My sister, thank God, saved the family by having two, two amazing nieces for, uh, for everybody and grandchildren. 
But before that, we were just like, do you want to have Thanksgiving? Uh, I guess we're supposed to. Yeah. <laughs> My family went to the local Mexican restaurant a couple years ago on Thanksgiving. Uh, I, <laughs> we're not a traditional family in, right. the, in the least sense. We had Mexican at the wedding. so <laughs> There we go. Uh, and, and it's so nice to add Sarah to the family. Uh, Sarah said they're spending a girls' day together, Francis, uh, Joyce, and Hannah. Uh, James Neese just commented, do, do you guys want to extend this a little bit and call James Neese? Let's do it. Do we want to hear from James? Let's I did promise Neese. All right, let's so, do it. <laughs> Neese, get yourself ready. We're going to call you. He, he, just, he just, yeah, thank you, Sarah. She said, I'm not invited to hang out with Francis Joyce and Hannah tomorrow. Uh, James Neese commented, LOL, quote unquote, my sister's vagina saved this family. <laughs> <laughs> Sucks so bad. <laughs> Uh, shit, you guys aren't going to be able to hear this because the headphones aren't working. Oh. Uh, so this pair of headphones here, you'll have to kind of share between you. So figure out where that goes. <laughs> Is it this one? Uh, it's, I think so. Can you hear it? James? Yeah. yeah. What's up, bruh? <laughs> Nothing, dude. Just... Waiting for you to get back to those messages, I feel like uh, like I got fucking sidelined, like some fucking ugly chick, man. <laughs> Bruh, you knew when and where. You don't don't give me your sass. I, I, I dude, I, I don't pull out, dude. And like, know, when you don't pull there. out. You got to sit here with like kids all night. You know what I mean? You went too I'm hard. Not like your sister with her magic vagina that makes the family come together. I'm kind of like you you uh you go too hard in the paint and that's why you've got two kids. Do you have two or three? Are you your dad of how many? I th- I heard you were working on a tenth. That's how you got to go, man. Like if you're not like, you know, constantly playing the field and getting that extra tax money, it's like 1000 $1,117 per kid. That's what I'm <laughs> talking about. <laughs> yeah, but I imagine they cost more than that a year, right? Not if you don't feed them. Uh McDonald's nuggets are like two bucks, you know. Um, you can definitely budget it out to get a profit, you know. How how old are they? Uh, three and one and a half. I'm surprised you knew, honestly. Like, yeah, I I look James at the social security dad. cards when I'm trying to, you know, get cable, you know. So, are, are, is there a train? <laughs> where, where do you live? Uh, <laughs> I'm I, I'm just saying I'm by the tracks right now. Like, you know, it's. There's like an RV over here. There's like a fucking train coming. Uh, just getting high, man. Like, what's up? <laughs> <laughs> now, uh, James, uh, mm. you're, 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 is, she's not your wife, is she? No, marriage is for suckers. The, you, no, you're telling uh, me. Uh, you should tell these two. Uh, your girl. It is. Like, go ahead. Like, it yeah. is. Like, you're going to get married. And then you're going to burn out, and you're going to be like, man, dude, it would be so nice if I could get a fucking futon and just, like, drink Pabst Blue Ribbon all day. But I can't anymore because i got to go stupid shopping at Ikea. You know, don't don't, don't make yourself go to <laughs> You're yeah, just dating the really wrong girls, on the and drink beer all day. <laughs> No, James has hand, and he, he takes a lot of hell from his girlfriend, who is lovely, by the way. I try to cuck all the time. Everybody likes to cuck, man. Like... Cucking is, you know, if you're not cucking, then you're cucked, you know, it's the way, the way she goes. It's James niece. We'll put on your tombstone, cuck or be cucked. <laughs> now, James, uh, yeah, I'm always sliding in your uh, girlfriend's DMs. I'm like, what's up, mm-hmm. ma? The, the, and she actually used it against him because he didn't buy enough. Uh, uh, what was the one? Jeez. Jesus. Uh, I, I forget. You drank like, all the orange juice, and so she was like, dude, "Spangled by me, orange juice." I'm like, you didn't go. <laughs> I think I said then go. Then it's like I, I, I can fucking hang here. I, I have pizza rolls in the fridge. I got Uncle Ben's rice aroni. You know, come on, like I'm good to go. That's <laughs> basically what's up. <laughs> now, uh, you are not a fan. You are thinking about running for chairman of the National Libertarian Party, are you not? 
as the meme squad, yeah. Like just because here, here, here here's my my philosophy on this was I always thought the Libertarian Party should be run like a business, you know, with like stock. Like if you donate more, you get more voting power, sort of thing. Right. And that just cuts out these people because let's just face it, people like James Weeks, like Arvin, they're broke as shit. They won't have a voice if that's the case. Like you'll get knocked out by the Koch brothers, you know. It's like. Uh, so you won't have Arvin making these comments or James Leakes stripping on stage because they're broke. <laughs> it's, it's like so. And it's the you, you get rid of this problem. You get rid of this problem easily if you run it like a like a C corp. It's a it's it's called they're the Coke brothers, not the Cock brothers. <laughs> no, they're Cock, man. I don't, I don't <laughs> want to call themselves. You know, it's it's what you sound like, so that's what I'm using. Now, uh, what is your uh, what is your pl- you know, what else are in your platform points? Uh, Anime titties, um, <laughs> you know, just real, real, real ANCAP shit, you know, like, I don't think I can even do that anymore because they kicked me out of the ANCAP group for going too hard in the paint. Yeah, yeah. free James Knees. Yeah, we, we covered that early on the show that you, you, sh- you literally got shit post, you shit posted so hard they kicked you out of the dregs of the internet. <laughs> like, you can't be Nick Warlord forever, you know, it's. And it's what happens. Like sometimes you make wrong decisions. Like I should invade India or something like that. You know, through the history of Mick warlords. But uh, yeah, they kicked me out because like I, I I I said doxing is trolling. Like doxing somebody is trolling, and they flipped out about it because nothing makes people like libertarians freak out more than you know because they'll say all types of shit on the internet. Then hey, I'm gonna post your phone number, bro. Like <laughs> how about that? And then they're like, oh shit, oh shit, oh shit, oh shit. You know, they they backtrack. And I'm like, that doesn't make sense because that's what we did on 4chan like all the time in like 2006, 2007 with Scientologists. I'm not saying libertarians are Scientologists. I'm just saying you're kind of the same. <laughs> <laughs> it's so true. Oh, my God. Yeah, the same guilt, the same shame to it, to techniques used. Oh, that's brilliant. It's so true, man. He literally did. He He's talking to this dude, and all of a sudden the guy is, like, trying to play it off real cool. Uh-huh. Like, it doesn't actually matter. And he goes, oh, I see the big bad meme boy is going to come out and get me. And then James Neese fires back with, your three-year-old kid already has meth mouth, and posts a picture of him. <laughs> <laughs> the admin of the group is like, hey, man, you want me to remove this guy? <laughs> <laughs> like, this dude was basically, like, he, he did some, like, I'm saving white culture posts and he's like posting like his stuff. He's like, yeah, I got like nine kids or some shit like that. So he's just like, you ain't ever going to find me. Cause like, you know, I'm, I'm fucking shit posting. I'm like, is this your wife? And I'm like, do you want me to tell your wife? Like what you're posting right now, dude? And he's just like, uh, uh, ban this motherfucker. Dude. Bam. Yeah. And right then now, bam. James finds her profile. Cause like, he's taken it off of his profile after all this is happening. Right. So that James can't find it. And then James posts a link to it in the comments and goes, too late, bro, I already found it. <laughs> <laughs> See, what's terrifying about James is that James literally is like an African warlord. He literally doesn't care about anything or anyone. He, he just cares about money. And he will do anything in his pursuit of money and for Kex. And so he terrifies these people, and he terrifies me, quite honestly, because he literally just doesn't care. Like, he, like, they're, uh, like, I've had to tell him multiple times, like, don't go after this person. They actually do a lot, and they, they're my friend, and they mean a lot to the, to We Are Libertarians. And he's like, yeah, but that's not for Kex, bro. <laughs> Like, I think I ball on Christy, like, a couple times in the Discord. Like, I'm like, I don't care if you donated. Like, who cares if you donated? Like, I could donate, you know, but. Can you take the cigarette out of your mouth, please? No, I have, like, uh, I'm eating, like, these, like, Tostito things. Uh. But, <laughs> like, like, you know, I troll Christy in the Discord all the time because she's like, I'm the super fan. I'm like, I've been here since episode 37. And then I, I see like Cat or like, who is it, Chloe? One of them is like a, like an admin and shit. And I was like, listen here, like you, listen here, thought you know, like back up. It's like, if I, like if I was admin, right? Like I would, I would just do like you know, Hunger Games type situations to remain in the group. You know, uh, I'm not saying like I would pit them in combat, but 
you, you gotta have you got, you have to call the week every now and then. There's some weak shit posters in the, in the We Are Libertarians group, and sometimes you gotta call them. You know, that's what we do in the Discord. You know, we just sit there. It's like, hey, you know, like welcome to our Discord. Like, ha, I'm an cap. It's like, okay, you're cancered. Like later, you know, you gotta call the week. <laughs> you tried to actually uh, management of We Are Libertarians. Actually, I was I was on your side, uh, James. I I advocated for you, but I had a, I had a conversation with. We are libertarians management, and they denied your request to be we are libertarians admin in the group. So, you know, like, I, I won that election. Like, you know, if people are like, how is a girl losing? These are a bunch of libertarians. I'm like, because my quality's top notch, dude. It's like, that's what's up, you know. But, uh, I could, but yeah, if I go to, if I go to New Orleans, I could probably outship post Arvin. You know, like Arvin's like, he hates schools. Is that what you guys are saying? Like, yeah. he hates schools. Like, I hate public schools. I'm like, charter schools aren't any better, dude. Like, like I, I can show you, like, how many times I haven't been paid or how many times people are fucking retarded, you know? It's like, <laughs> sometimes the private sector doesn't work, you know? It just doesn't work because, uh, like I told Harry and the, the Discord group, it's like 99% of businesses are retarded, and it's just, you know, they get money. You know, as long as you get money, you think you're successful. Oh, well, we made a profit, you know, but... It doesn't matter if the entire management core doesn't know what they're doing. Um, that, that happens a lot. Like, there's times that people don't get paid or people don't uh, don't get like recognition in the workplace or anything like that. So private, you know, private schools are just a dumb thing like that. You know, they tend to offsource all their um, their management to management companies in California or Ontario, Canada. You're basically trusting your child's future to a management company that's not even in the U.S. that doesn't even speak English, you know? Right. Right. Somehow that's better. All yeah, right. it's just like, well, they, well, they manage just the HR side of it and they manage the accounting. It's like, yeah, but you're paying like five grand per student, right, so they can get like educational materials. And I'll, I'll tell you a story like how, how we did this. Like we got 5300 something dollars per student, but – about like 10% of that actually went to the students, you know, like it went to the rest of it went to software solutions, uh, consultants, outsourced companies that basically handled all the stuff. We were paying the bulk of that money to uh, private companies, basically just to sell us software solutions so we could sit a kid down at a computer for eight hours a day so they can click next on a quiz. It's just, right. you know, that's, that's how terrible it is. And like, you know, he'll support it and be like, you know, well, I just don't like public teachers because they steal money from me. It's like, you think private companies don't steal money from you? Is, is that, you know, that's his rationale is, well, public steals money. It's like, well, private money, private companies steal money from you all the time. Like you just willingly do it. You think they're not. It's like, well, it's good for the market. It's good for, yeah, uh, but the difference uh, is one of those you know, is voluntary. The other one is not right. Exactly. I wouldn't even say it's voluntary. When you go into the contract, you think it's voluntary. I give you five grand. You spend that five grand on my student to educate my student. But they'll tell you to your face, like, yeah, we'll totally spend the money on your student. You know, no problem. We'll get them educated. But the money you gave them, only five, ten percent actually goes to your student. So, yeah, they, you voluntarily gave them your money, but they voluntarily lied to your face about it as well. <laughs> you know, it's like it's not really the, the obscure the metrics and all that. Like, Hundreds of charter schools, hundreds of private schools close every year because some don't even uh, are not even open for like a day or two. Like there's tons of schools that are only open for like one or two days and closed because all the financials are gone. Yeah. Um, you know, you get you get wrecked like that because you're trusting something that's for profit that's only wanting to take the money. And wants to get the money, there's no obligation to deliver the goods. Or when they do deliver the goods, it's such a baseline product. They're like, well, you can't sue me because we, we did deliver what we said we're going to deliver, even if it's subpar. And, of course, you're thinking, well, I'll just go to the next school over because it, it's private. You know, I can just go to this other school. It's a free market. But here's the thing. It's not like a couch or a, an Xbox or TV or consumer goods. Like, you're dealing with education, right? So you're, you're, you're good in your product and service as, like, an 8-year-old kid that now has to hop from private school to private school to private school, you know, like most of it is like uh, developmental years are hopping between locations. So the end product you have here is just a student that doesn't know where he belongs. It isn't properly educated is below reading level is below math level for his age group because there's nothing consistent because you're treating the kid like a commodity that you're trading like Bitcoin or something else. Which is, so, which is my problem with privatization of things like the prisons, because it, you commoditize human lives. No, it, 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 is, it is a problem. Like, uh, you know, it's 
I'm not under like the non the non compete agreements anymore and stuff. So I'll I'll openly say it. I think when when I worked at the private school I worked at, I think only 20% actually moved up to the grade level. The rest were just getting bumped up just to make your metrics. You know, they're not. I wouldn't say they adequately passed. I watched them just do YouTube all day, like play YouTube, play video games all day. They didn't do any work, and they would just get passed because 75% of them are special needs. And what happens in special needs courses is. Well, yeah, you failed five classes, and technically you should be held back. But because you're special needs, we have to move you up based on guidelines we've like incorporated into our charter with how the state views it, with how the charter board views it. So you're bumping up kids that are not even prepared to go to the next grade. So then it just snowballs from there. So now you have a high school graduate that's more ignorant than a, a middle schooler. You know, and then you have to send them out to college, and they're going to fail college. You know, you're not going to succeed in college when you don't even have basic math down. So then they fell out of college, and now you have, like, a kid that's, like, 30 grand, 40 grand in debt working at McDonald's. And, you know, it's treating kids like commodities on on capital gains or any sort of uh, for-profit system is just, like, you're just breeding an entire generation of idiots. And I don't know how he doesn't see that, you know? Yeah, so I should, before I ask him about Sarwark, I should say James worked at charter schools as as their their head of tech. And so – you you have uh, you have been a critic, and I want serious, James. But like you've been a critic of Sarwark for long before really anybody else. Like when people were even kind of like like into Nick and said he was doing a good job, you're really critical of him. Yeah, um, I think he does a baseline job. Like, and what I mean by baseline is the, the, the ball and standards are so low for the Libertarian Party that anything that looks like a net positive is kind of cheered as, like, a great revolution. You know, it's like, well, you know, he did get us, like, three more votes than last year, so technically that's, that's good, right? We got, instead of, like, 1%, we got 1.2%. You know, that, that's the metric of success was we got 1.2% as opposed to 1%. And, like, that's a really shitty metric when you had four years to prepare for this, uh you, you ran into a presidential race, uh, totally unprepared. I mean, you did get some ballot access everywhere else. You know, you got ballot access in Michigan or I think Ohio, too, so a couple states. Uh, but basically what his leadership is, is basically done was say, I'm just going to be meany as shit. I'm going to sit there and say, you're not welcome in my party if I think you're a Nazi, which like, how do you define who's a Nazi? You know, is that, is that your, 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 your executive decree that, I think you're a white supremacist, so you're not welcome in my party. And like, who gets to decide that? Do you get to decide that, or some committee get to decide it? Um, it it's just a whole string of issues that it's a really laid back form of management that sort of snowballed into what you see with Arvin and what you see with all these all all the other radical caucus members. Um, it's just. He, he, he has the inability to be the bad guy. And like when you lead an organization, you have to be a bad guy sometimes. Like sometimes you have to kick people out. Sometimes you have to yell at them. Sometimes you have to do stuff that's not popular. And the reason they just don't do this has always been like, oh, well, I want to run next year. Or I want to still be like a member. Like the Libertarian Party has this like echelon and membership where like you can be a basic member or you can be one of these like five to 10 to 15 people that are like these big names in the Libertarian Party that keep getting assigned to these roles all the time. Right. They don't want to lose that base. It's like Nick Starwalk doesn't want to be the random delegate from Arizona or wherever he's from. He doesn't want to be that. He wants to be the chair. He wants to be the vice chair. He wants to be on these special committees. He wants to do that. So he can't sit there and say, Arvin, you're being retarded because then Arvin goes back and tells all the radical caucus, all these other like ANCAP leading caucuses that, hey, this guy right here doesn't like what we say, doesn't like what we do. So the next election comes around, you get booted out because these caucuses rise up against you and say like, well, you're, you're ruling like a tyrant, you know, and it's just it's funny listening to them say that, you know, it's like you're ruling like a tyrant, like these people aren't middle managers in a company and don't berate their employees on a daily basis. Yeah. It's just, it just blows my mind. Like, if if someone was basically letting a bad employee uh, just go on your social media account and just blast stupid stuff, there's not one libertarian, not one libertarian that owns a business that would have somebody on their social media say rape comments like that. They would be fired the next day, but they don't put that same like you know integrity with what their leadership is. So it's like if I'm uh, so-and-so libertarian, I own like a, a, a company with 50 employees. We do drywall and stuff. And then 
my secretary who does the social media says something like, you know what's better than drywall? Rape. Because rape is really good, you know? It's like, I'll compare, uh, or if you're a propane salesman, it's like, you know, if you're not buying propane, then you're buying charcoal, and charcoal is literally child molestation. You know, it's stupid <laughs> shit like that. Like, if anybody owned the company, they've seen that on the social media website, and they start getting those one-star reviews, like, they start popping off, that employee's gone the next day. We don't, we don't see that in the Libertarian Party where people do stuff like that and they're gone the next day. Like, we can't. It's like, well, they have to vote them out. But it's hard to vote people out because there's people that agree with what Arvin said and they'll fight tooth and nail to keep them in those positions. Yeah, and those people have ran off all the effective people. And so what you're left with is the lowest common denominator of, of the last 40 years. It, it, it should be that. Like, it, the Libertarian Party doesn't need to have, like, a platform where, like, it's like a purity platform. It just needs to be like a total change in management philosophy. Like the, the, the GOP and the DNC, you know, even though they're corrupt in some instances where they kind of collude with certain candidates, they don't tolerate that. Like the GOP is not going to tolerate a communications major that goes full blown. Like, uh, by the way, Jesus says that if you have an abortion, you're going to hell. Let me post this on the GOP's like, you know, social media accounts because that's just going to start a shit storm. Like, they'll get rid of that person. They'll get rid of that communications director. He'll be gone the next day. We don't do that in the LP. These people stay there for, like, years on end and keep doing the same stuff. There's no accountability. It's all like, well, the delegates have to decide. The voting body has to decide. It's like, but the thing with democracy is voters don't really know what they want. They just want something they can like, agree with at one point in time that they might disagree with later, so they vote against it later. It, it's a very inorganic way to kind of make decisions you're kind of leaving it on to people to vote but when you leave it on to people to vote people have an attention span of 15 minutes and they'll totally forget about it when it's time to vote and they kind of pr- they rely on that it's like i can't stuff i say six months from stuff i say today won't be remembered six months from now except for that one dude that just totally remembers it because he documented it but then you just have that one dude screaming at it you know but james Neese said this six months ago but no one else is going to care because it's so long past that they're just like well we'll look at the issues now So I always thought that, you know, when we have to vote on these, like, officers that don't have any sort of, like, checks and balances on there, like, people forget about all the stuff they did prior to it, and they just remember this one thing, and this one person brings it up, and no one cares. Shane? Right, I was going to say, sorry, I was going to say the, uh... He had headphones on, and he heard his voice for the first time, and had to take the headphones off immediately (laughs) because it freaked him out. Yeah, well, it just messed up my... Train of thought yeah. <laughs> there, but uh, and it's also very loud of me yeah, too. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> um, basically, we were talking about this the other day about how the LP needs to run more like a business. We don't operate in any way like a business, right? As far as what we expect from our people, what we expect, how we expect to operate through the campaign season. It's more of kind of hey, we'll just wing it when the time comes, rather than having preparation and essentially doing what a business does and making progress. Granted, we don't operate in the same way with uh, having customers and that kind of stuff, but we're trying to get voters. We're spending money. We're raising money. We should treat it like a business and, well, well, part of the problem is there's no incentive structure. There's no profit structure. Like in, in the Republican or Democratic Party, you're not paid, although they do have paid employees that do the business of the party, but the currency in the other two parties is political power. And the Libertarian Party has really nothing to offer anybody in any way other than good feels. And so that doesn't really incentivize a lot of people to do anything because good feels are quickly drowned out by the bad feels of dealing with just ineffective losers who are constantly just being awful to you personally and online and embarrassing you. And you just go, well, like, what am I fighting for? And then so you end up with this whole group of people which – I have a lot of people that I've been in the Libertarian Party with that are now in this zone, and I'm quickly headed there myself, where you're just in like this, you know, you're in this no man's land where you're not a Republican, you're definitely not a Democrat, and you're not even a Libertarian Party person. You'll still vote for the majority of the candidates if they're on your ballot, but like it's not worth your time and effort because the incentives are all negative. And so the Libertarian Party, what I'm saying is has, has to... Rethink the incentive structure, be it hiring paid employees to manage uh, things or or incentivizing with, you know, a better culture, then then you're going to fix it. I feel like we, 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 we bottom of the barrel like a lot of the times. Right. And 
when it, when it's time for convention, like I see people pop up that like I want to run for district 37 representative i don't know i don't even know who this dude is like he just came here like i don't know i got you're not my social media like i've never seen you at anything you know any event but they just roll into convention right and he's like i want to run for this and then we just all say yay or nay everyone is afraid to say nay and it's hilarious like you know you, no one knows this dude like he just popped up randomly says some stuff like i think uh we had one dude last uh last convention that was uh I think Israel's a terrorist state, you know, and the only person that said no was Sam, but that's just because Sam's a Jew, you know, and that's, that's, <laughs> that, that's it, you know, that's it, like, he offended, like, the one Jewish person in the audience, and that was the only no, right. um, so we, we, we don't vet these people, and then it's time to run for, like, you know, office, like, we, we get the notary, we sign their papers, we send it to the, you know, the election office or whatever, and then, uh, we never hear from them again, like, they're on the ballot, but they don't do any work. Like it, even in Frankfurt for the local races, we had one guy that wanted to run for a council, right? Like he came in, he did the paperwork. I never heard from him again. Like he did zero work, nothing, no yard signs, no knocking, nothing. He just right, disappeared. That's fairly common. Uh, what was it? I said, yeah, that's fairly common in the, yeah. in the market here is that you get a lot of people that come in, they show up for a meeting and then they disappear. Yeah, but if you don't vet people like that, right? The, right. the reason why the, the GOP has like a lot of success in Indiana isn't because the Democrats are weak. It's just the GOP has a lot of power players. And what I mean by power players is the guy running in uh, for this con uh, congressional district four, which is Rakita's old seat. Right. Uh, it, I think it's the right congressional district. I mean, his, his name's like uh, Diego Morales, right? But yeah. Diego has spent like the last 20 years in like in all forms of government capacity, uh, the mayor's office, the governor's office, like everyone whose photos he's with Mike Pence, he's with somebody else that's like somebody in Indiana. So he has the benefit going into this election of, oh, I know these people, I know this person, I know this. So he's in like a thousand dollar suit, all these connections. He's been involved in every single community event going forward. And it doesn't matter who the Democrats run, like you have no chance of beating somebody with that level of commitment to both uh, both community, state, and government. So it's a loss. No matter who you run at somebody like that, you're, you're going to lose. Right, and those uh, are the types of people they have on their bench. We don't, we don't do bench. that. We just pick up whoever was willing to run. It, it doesn't matter if like he has no community experience. Like He's like a mechanic. Down, he's a downtown mechanic at the Goodyear. He puts tires on a car. That's all he does. So there's no there's no credentials here he's just a guy that wants to run and so when you put him up there in the debate it doesn't matter how his talking points are the people in the audience that you're debating to they're already they already know who they're going to vote for so you're up there being like i think we should lower taxes it doesn't matter what the republican says because that republican, republican has far more social clout than you do he doesn't have to say anything people are like yeah that dude used to work for here 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 i've seen him around as he gives posters i see this dude's name everywhere and who are you? Just some mechanic running off about like taxation and stuff. You know, right. you just get stomped by people that have much more prestige than you. And we have a prestige problem. We don't have any candidates like that. We had Gary Johnson, but to be fair, no one really knows who Gary Johnson is. People in this state don't even know who he is half the time. When we, when we phone banked like his home state of New Mexico, like, hey, do you remember Gary Johnson? Like half the people didn't even remember who he was. So like your biggest ticket item with someone that's noteworthy to an extent that he has to remind people he's noteworthy. So how do you, how do you fix the problem? How do you fix it? Um, uh, you have to attract people that, you know, are at least uh, better at things. Like the reason Jeremiah and Rex do better in uh, Henry County is because everybody knows who he is. You know, everybody knows who Rex is. Everybody knows who Jeremiah is He's on the park board. He just does what he wants to do in Henry County. You know who he is. Uh, you have to find people that are willing to run. And if you can't find somebody that's willing to run that is well-known or has some sort of like, you know, social pedigree, then just don't run anybody at all. You know, it's better just to say, I'm not going to run a candidate in this district than this nobody who's not going to show up, who's not going to do campaigns. That's just going to be like a one percenter on like the vote totals because it just makes you look bad because then people look at the vote totals like, who is this dude that got 1%? You know, it's like they look at that and like, that's some loser stuff. Like you're a loser. Like you, you can't, put losers into a race that you know they're going to lose so people can look at it after the like the vote totals are in and be like well i told you that guy was a loser you know that's that's the biggest problem like just if 
if they can't guarantee at least 10% going forward, you know, on any sort of race, you shouldn't run them. That, that should be the new metric, at least for state parties, local parties, and on national. If you can't at least get us beyond like a 5%, 10%, 15% margin, don't run them. Like there needs to be like a, a system in place to do that, to like, vet them. Like what, what community events do you do? What is your resume? Like what professional like, you know, experience do you have? You, you have to vet people in that manner as opposed to just like, well, this guy says some really neat stuff that's pro-libertarian, you know? Like, well, anybody can do that. 17-year-old kids high in their parents' basement do that. You know, that's right. a bad metric. Right, and we should be – I brought this up last time. We need more like business owners, that kind of stuff that have a background in a community because if you run somebody for city council and they own the bar that's been there for 20 years – that everybody knows that person if it's a small town. There's 20,000 people that live in this town, and there's the neighborhood bar that's been there forever. Everybody knows that guy, and if he if if he's liberty-minded, then he needs to be brought in and somehow talk to and figure out how to run him as a candidate and win a couple small races that way. It's essentially it, it, the same thing, it, it, just on a there's, small there's also level. A big, there's also a big problem is – People that are successful know the Libertarian Party isn't successful. You know, right. they know you're not successful. So if I'm like a really popular dude, people like me, I've got the money to run. It's like, why not just run as a Republican? That guarantees me an ability to win. People like to win. And it's like if I'm a Libertarian, I'm running for like a Libertarian seat, right? I can take my whole platform that is Libertarian. I can go apply to the GOP, and I'll probably win the race based on what county I'm in. You know, it's just right. why why go with the loser when you can get a surefire win no matter what? Like, no one is – there's no Democrat or Libertarian that's ever going to win Boone County, Hancock County, you know, uh, Tippecanoe County, Clinton County. That is so heavily Republican that you can just be a total waste, and you can still win that. So if I'm a business owner and I say, oh, I want to be a congressman, I, there's no, no matter what the libertarian says, no matter if he agrees with you, if he really wants to win, he is not going to put that L next to his name because that's just an L on his record. You know, it's like it's, it's literally like a pun on words. That L next to your name stands for lose. You know, and that's we, we just don't have that credentials. And just to get that, you have to secure wins somewhere. Like there has to be some win on some level, uh, not just like your local uh, – uh, advisory board. Like, I, I'm the advisory board person in this town of 500 people. You just, like, get a council race in a major city. If you start winning council races in major cities, you start winning something that has some sort of metric of success, then people are like, hey, I could win it too. But without a success factor, no one's, no one, you're not going to get anybody worth anything that's running for these offices besides people that are just going to get you the 1% to 2%. Yeah, like there in in the area that we've talked about in Dakota's area, there are a lot of elected people at lower levels because of Rex's big coattails, but the, you don't know their name necessarily. But I remember Andrew Gray was on the city council of Topeka, Kansas. Like he was an elected libertarian in Topeka, Kansas, to their city council. Like, and I remember five years later, six years later, what his name was because it was like, wow, this is, a, this is a sign of progress. We're on a city council in, a, in the name of a town I've heard of. Right. Well, so. you know, I, I always thought we should focus on, like, Nebraska, right? Nebraska has the benefit of being unicameral, and you can't run as a party. You, you, you don't have to put libertarian next to your name where people are going to associate that with. But once you're elected, you can just come out and say it. You know, you can win, if you win a unicameral seat in Nebraska and – Either a governorship or like a legislative seat, and be like, I'm, uh, I, yeah, I ran with the Libertarian Party. That's huge because you don't have to have that ominous, well, it's another Libertarian election. Here's that one percent coming through. You don't have to put that next to your name unless you want to put that next to your name. Right. And so you can totally obscure the fact until like you do score that win and be like, by the way, you know, I'm a Libertarian. Boom, it's going to be in the paper. You know, like Libertarian wins uh, Nebraska governorship. In Nebraska is a pretty easy state to win. It's not that big. It's um, these election laws are pretty nicely attuned to running whatever you want to run. That's why, like, there's socialists that win there. That's why there's like Green Party members that win there. All right. Final thoughts, James. Uh, my final thoughts is I I need to get back in Kapistan and like I know we listen to this shit sometimes and like I'm sorry for doxing. But, like, I literally have nothing to do all day unless I can shitpost. I'm, I'm working on that, James. 
I'm yeah, start like, a campaign in there. for you. I, I also need admin credentials on We Are Libertarians. Sorry, Christy, if I have to donate 500 bucks to get this, I'm going to do it and I'm going to ban you for, for never for questioning me, Christy, for questioning me. Um, he thinks it's only $500. He thinks that's enough. Yeah, that, please. That I is, sneeze uh, at $500. I will, you, I will give you money if you let me ban Christy. Just let me ban her like for a day just to show her that I'm I'm the warlord now, right? <laughs> it's just <laughs> – Something simple. I'm not going to go too crazy. I might like remove all the women, you know, just because I just think they make bad decisions. But you know, it's it's just something that needs to happen. But in in terms of like Arvin and uh, things that need to fix the Libertarian Party, it just needs a total rehaul about how we elect leaders, how we need to uh, run party business to get these people out. I think you know we should definitely ban like radical caucuses um get rid of these people and like you think that's unpopular and there's certain pink hair people that ban me for saying stuff like that but it's just <laughs> subtle <laughs> you know and like i'm sure bittner will pop in and be like well it's just how it is i'm like i know what's how it is but you know if, if it's your money you're not going to be doing the same way i doubt bittner talks to comcast the same way you know what i mean or golf or anybody else you know i don't know where bittner works anymore i assume he works at comcast because he looks like he installs cable <laughs> <laughs> uh james i was going to stick up for christy and say you're never allowed to ban christy she's done too much for us but she says a thousand dollars and you can ban her for a day ban her for a day Dude, like for a thousand bucks, like I'm not only going to ban her, right? Like I, I'm going to drive to her house and I'm going to knock on her door and I'm going to sit there and be like, hi, I'm James, the admiral of the We Are Libertarians group. Do you care to like take a like, minute survey and just <laughs> pop in and crash on her couch and sleep on her couch and never leave? Like, I, <laughs> <laughs> so I think she's used to that, honestly. <laughs> All right. Thank you, James. Uh, you, this has been mind expanding and uh, odd. Uh, I mean, it's, it's always odd when it's on the phone, man. Sometimes you got to call in, and I'm not there to make, like, propane jokes or anything like that, you know, but I'm sitting there looking at it on the screen, and god damn, dude, like, it, it's super tiny. I, Dakota's got a glass. I don't think there's any drink in the glass. He's just looking at the thing, man. It's, do you have juice in that or what? No, oh, it's empty. It's totally empty now. And then Shane has a vat of liberal tears. Yeah, and they're gone now. It's a Yeti. It's a Yeti tumbler. So he spent seventy eight dollars on his tumbler. <laughs> we got to point out that Chris that's has a, like a really gift. old monitor because that's a DVI cord, and he needs to update the HDMI. And if Christy wants to donate some more money for an HDMI cord to get him some new computer screens, that would be great because this is twenty seventeen, not twenty twelve. Christy, he shouldn't be using <laughs> DVI cords. That's, that's right. Goodwill level shit. This this was free. Good, exactly. Good little level. Sh- get him an HDMI cord. Get him like a 4K resolution monitor, 4K. and I won't ban you. <laughs> <laughs> All right, thanks, James. We'll talk to you later. All right. Silly. I love that kid. <laughs> I mean, you see what I mean? Like, if people like, I'm always worried that like, and we are libertarians. This James exemplifies we are libertarians. Like the first. Five minutes of that phone call, you go, This, I'm not going to take this seriously. Listen to this. Yeah. And then you listen to him and you go, Wow, that's really smart. Right. You know, like that's he, quintessential we are libertarians. I think James James nailed it with so much of his analysis of the Libertarian Party. And it's, it is, it's tough. But if, if you're a libertarian and you want to change a neoconservative party like the Republicans, or you want to change the Democratic Party because you're, you know, a Glenn Greenwald liberal. Or if you want to change the libertarian by changing the political system, I mean, it, none of this is going to be easy. Right. And there's going to be challenges no matter what political action you take, if you want to take political action. There are the people like Roger Paxton out there who say taking political action is a complete waste of your time. Just change your community, you know, I don't know, spiritually or whatever, where you're, you, you know, you're connecting people on a um, on a private basis and you're creating things like uh, – the the private healthcare system that Rand Paul wanted to support by, you know, opt out of insurance. We find doctors that opt out of insurance. You donate to this fund. You only use it for catastrophic stuff. Uh, all that good stuff. Are you talking shit in a group chat, Dakota? Right now? Mm-hmm. No. Because 
Jeremiah says, let Dakota home he, go home. He has shit to do. He is uh, referencing my plans in the morning. I'm taking Jeremiah Morrill hunting for the very first time tomorrow morning. Oh. Jeremiah, let me explain something to you. Dakota is a is a grown man. He has yeah. a better beard than Shane and I combined. That's what we were talking about. He's very bossy. I know. He knew when he signed up to come on We Are Libertarians. He knew that. I, I knew. It's not even 10 o'clock yet. No. This is a record for We Are Libertarians. I, I still got time to go home and play Skyrim <laughs> right. for like three hours. Leave us alone. Stop bossing us around. You are not my boss. I'm your boss. Let me do my thing, Mom. You want me to cancel you? <laughs> I will cancel you. But guess what? Boss Hog of Liberty with Dakota Davis. Changing the art today. Ooh. <laughs> 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 All right, very good. So uh, where can people listen to the Boss Hog of Liberty? Uh, just go to bosshogofliberty.com. Where we are East Central Indiana's favorite podcast, and we are also uh, Indiana's number one tractor podcast. <laughs> so you know, check us out on the website, or you can search Boss Hog of Liberty on YouTube. Uh, we're also I take care of all the YouTube videos, and they get put up there and on our Facebook page. It's like an uh, an unironic Mayberry meets Joe Rogan. I don't know. No. <laughs> it's like <laughs> that's like we were we were talking about like um, doing a facelift on the artwork, right? And right. You and I were messaging back and forth, and you're like, "Well, in your artwork, you really have to put like what your podcast is." And I'm like, <laughs> <laughs> "I was like, what are you trying to express to the listener?" You're like, "I." To listen know. to the podcast, right, like, yeah, right. yeah. so you'll you'll get there. So yeah, <laughs> check it out, Boss Hog of Liberty. Uh, all our We Are Libertarians podcasts are at wearelibertarians dot com. Shane, final thoughts? Basically, man, just keep the infighting to a minimum. <laughs> that's yeah. my that's the biggest thing out there. If anybody's in, involved in the party, it does no good to take shots at the back of your fellow soldiers in front of you. Right. Zero good. There's a reason why yeah. for years the back plenty. row in the military never shot. Right. Yeah. Yeah, exert all that energy on all the Bernie bros out there. Exactly. Just, to, like, just, why even waste your time? Like, I'm at a point where, you know what I what I do? I literally post my thoughts, and then I unfollow the post as I post it. So I never see any of the comments. Like, I, I've got Brilliant. posts from the last three days that I've literally not got, gone back and read the comments. Because when I'm in the emotional state... To read comments on Facebook, I will do that. But, like, you know, because you just have to go, all right. Because I get pissed when people disagree with me. Like, I I, I do. I'm the the exact same way. And so I get mad about it, and I want to be like, listen, you fat mother. You know, (laughs) like, like I want to go back at people, but, like, I have to just be in a place where I'm just like, all right, let's have a real dialogue with this person. A lot of times I will flare up and go at that person. They'll go back at me, and then after, like, ten comments, we're friends. Watch out, son. Nap's about to be violated. Right. (laughs) You come on my lawn, break five of my ribs, I'm I'm using my yard yard nuke on you. Um, Like, (laughs) recreational yard. Nuke. Is that Rand Paul story getting weirder and weirder? Something about that yeah, doesn't it is happen. So crazy. Something is going on here that we don't understand and don't know, and it's really it was weird. entirely politically motivated. I'm yeah. just gonna come out and say it right now. Yeah, that his is, lawyer's story is BS because right. he's trying to uh, avoid the federal charges that come along with attacking a senator. Right, right, and he's just trying to get it lower down to just a regular assault between neighbors. Exactly. Whereas Rand Paul was retweeting that it was not that it was politically motivated. He was they commenting had, at it. They had seven of Rand Paul's neighbors and the president of the homeowners association that said, Yeah, he takes really good care of his yard. There's no way that it was over yard lawn clippings and uh leaf compost. Interesting. Yeah, yeah. no, there's something and, and I think even if, if it's not like Rand might be petty enough to be like, no, it was politically motivated, send him to prison. I hate that guy. <laughs> like, uh, I've had some neighbors. That, that would be me. If I was Rand Paul, that would be me. I'd right. be like, finally, this douchebag is out of my neighborhood. Yes, he's, go- he's going to a federal penitentiary, and I hope you get anally raped. Let's, let's reopen Guantanamo for this piece. <laughs> Calling Trump. Uh, uh, I've got one of those favors I've got to call in. <laughs> right. Uh, so yeah, Are, do we still waterboard Donald? <laughs> so yeah, there's something weird about that. But yeah, uh, what were we? What was I going to say? What was I talking about? 
All right, let's go Speaking back. Speaking of which, waterboarding at Guantanamo Bay sounds great if you don't know what either of those two right, things are. Exactly. <laughs> so much they just, fun. They it's take in... care of that in the Kennedy sex tunnels. It's Cuba. <laughs> <laughs> Shane, final thoughts? Um, that's that's it for me. I mean, Thank I don't you. have a podcast like anybody else unless we're starting up wall sports where we can give the libertarian perspective of... Uh, Is he going to be the wall <laughs> chick McGee? Yes. <laughs> yes. You, 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 I actually know a libertarian that knows anything about sports. Yeah. I didn't know that. Congratulations. Yeah, Jeremiah knows a lot about sports. J- yeah, Jeremiah knows a lot about everything. Yeah. <laughs> and he'll, he's happy to tell me on, on my own podcast. <laughs> yeah. I don't know anything about sports. Me Nothing either. At all. Uh, no. I just cannot stand even just. Just the atmosphere surrounding sports. I took a, really? I, yeah. I took a date to a Colts game. It was her, her first football game. She's Colombian. So when I told right. her we were going to a football game and we showed up at the Colts game, she was like, what? <laughs> <laughs> so confused. But uh, she, it was like the blind leading the blind. It was so, she's like, okay, so if they take that thing and they get it in there, they get that many points. I'm like, uh-huh. You're like, yeah, and, and they get paid millions of dollars to do it. Right. That was your chance to look like an expert, though. Oh, I did look like an expert. <laughs> I don't know if any of it was right, but I certainly looked like I knew what I was doing. So, uh, yeah, the, maybe a sports show someday in the future. Right. So yeah, we got to get that going. Yeah. And- I'll tap you. <laughs> Very good. All right. Thanks for being here, Shane, and thanks for looking so handsome. Thank you for having you me. You too, Dakota. All right. Thank you for joining us here on this episode of We Are Libertarians. You guys are so good to us, and we appreciate everything that you do for us. Please uh, be sure to subscribe on Patreon. I, uh, I'm even bored with myself. <laughs> um, uh, one note, and I hope that you all listened to this. Uh, I put a warning in there, uh, I, and, and I'll put another warning at the beginning of the show because I don't want to lose a single one of you. <laughs> you're all I have left, uh, listener. Uh, you're the last uh, thing in my life <laughs> that I can count on. So please don't abandon me, too. Uh, I need you to make sure that your RSS feed is right. Now, here's what an RSS feed is. I take the file that I've recorded on the Zoom. I upload it to a website. I put the title and, the, and the, 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 all the stuff in there. It then sends it out to this little feed, this RSS feed, that then puts the file in your podcatcher, and you download from my host. All right? Now, I've been using something called Fi- FeedBurner. And FeedBurner, I've used it for years because this this was the best option six years ago. And FeedBurner basically reroutes and gives – back then, you did, you couldn't get statistics unless you used FeedBurner, really. So uh, I used FeedBurner to get statistics and to help change a bunch of different reasons. Anyways, not important. But FeedBurner is owned by Google. Google has a habit of shutting things down very quickly for almost no reason without warning. And so, and it also has problems because they don't keep it updated anymore. And so, I'm not going to use the feed burner RSS feed anymore. We are going to use the fireside RSS that our host provides. So, if you have problems, you should not notice a difference. Like, if you're an iTunes, Stitcher, Overcast, Pocket Casts, you've already been updated on the, on the platform with the new RSS feed, and you shouldn't know a difference. Most of you listen on the, like, 95% of you, which is amazing. Listen on the podcast app, the Apple podcast app on the iPhone. So, but for those of you who use, like, a Downcast, like, I use Downcast, and I subscribe to the, to the FeedBurner feed, if, if here in the next couple months that feed may stop working, and if it does, go to wearelibertarians.com and grab the new RSS feed. If if and when we switch, there's problems and the feed stops working for any of the We Are Libertarians podcasts. Go to WeAreLibertarians.com and grab that new RSS feed. Uh, it's it's a nerve wracking thing to take thousands of subscribers to this one URL and move them to another URL and not lose a single one. So I'm going to try my best to make sure that none of us get separated. Okay, so hold each other's hands <laughs> as we walk through uh, this. As we walk through Congress here, uh, if you if the feed stops working, we are libertarians.com. We've got eight podcasts. 
you can go to the front page. They're all updated with all the new RSS feeds. If you want to be proactive and put that in your feed, feed uh, your podcatcher, you can do that now. You can listen to We Are Libertari- Libertarians Radio while you're there. So check out all of our podcasts. Get the feed. Make sure that you don't get lost. Uh, we would greatly appreciate it. So big things always happening. And thank you for your support because the ability to upgrade all of our podcasts to the podcast host, it's it's expensive to do that, and uh, but it's better for you. It's more reliable, and our Patreon subscribers pay for all of that, and I can't thank them enough. So thank you for joining us here on this episode of We Are Libertarians, and until next week, we say be good to each other. Okay. Very good. Thank you for coming.